Well, welcome, folks. What you find normally with this subject is that it goes as far as do UFOs exist? And people then want to kick the tires on the UFOs. Well, first of all, if they had tires and that kind of landing gear, it means it's made by Lockheed Martin and my uncle's old company, North of Grumman, um, and it's an anti-gravity device. Secondly, um, if it's only in this dimension, meaning 3D or 4D, if you count, count time, time is the fourth, then it is an interstellar. So the first thing to get a, your mind around is to forget everything you know about conventional wisdom if you've studied the UFO subject, but also what you know about conventional science, because they're both antiquated and have been purposely kept antiquated. I'll get into this in a moment. Dumbed down. Uh, and what I want to do is share what I think you and the public need to know to understand what has been called the phenomenon, sort of this, this sort of meta-phenomenon of ET contact and uh, UFO phenomenon that goes beyond just the fact that they're moving at 100,000 miles per hour and can make a right-hand turn without decelerating and not kill the pilots on board with, you know, a thousand G-forces or whatever that would be. Um, because, you know, that's all very interesting, but it, it kind of begs the question of, if they're interstellar, how'd they get here? And th the fact that they're here, a priori, they use something that's beyond even post-quantum physics. And this is a little bit like going back to Thomas Jefferson's era, was only a couple of hundred years ago, and showing him this thing, a smartphone. And there'd be no foundation for understanding this. This would be metaphysical. So to the new age people, they say, well, it's a metaphysical thing. Well, I said, well, meta, it's meta, what meta what? What do you mean metaphysical? Metaphysical is just a term that people use when they don't quite understand the science of a, of a phenomenon that's occurring. There's no metaphysical. It's all a level of consciousness of where you're coming from. So if you're an advanced civilization that's interstellar, by definition, you're trans-dimensional. So you're dropping out of linear space-time, and then you're reappearing at another point in space-time, but not in a straight line. And the comprehension of that requires a lot of humility on the part of humans, <laughs> which we typically lack, but particularly scientists and theologians. We'll get, get to that a little bit later. There's people with spiritual understanding. Because the, the, the paradigm is one of coming, where there is this nexus where these, what the physicist Gaswami described as the self-aware universe comes together with post-quantum physics and way past spin theory and string theory and where you begin to be, be very cognizant of the fact that these technologies that are interstellar are operating from a level of an understanding of the, of the cosmos and reality that is one where consciousness and the mind is present at every level, even the 3D level because it's the only thing that explains the phenomena uh, and all the different manifestations. So I use this term TDIS, trans-dimensional interstellar. And so I just want to introduce that right off the bat. So TDIS is a term that I use for um, what we're dealing with when we look at the science of consciousness and the physics of how the spacecraft move, operate in our space, but also go from one star system to another. And, of course, in the aerospace industry, they have more colorful terms for this. I was flying last year to Australia, and I was accidentally was put beside a man going from Sydney to Brisbane uh, who was a Northrop Grumman engineer. I said, oh, it's my uncle's old company. My uncle worked on the lunar module, the thing that landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong in it. And he says, oh, yeah, that's cool, really cool. And I said, yeah, and he's a young engineer. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm here for a meeting. He says, oh, I said, kind of dealing with some of the stuff that 
you may or may not deal with. And I just opened the door a little bit. He says, oh yeah, we know what, we, we call that PFM. I said, what? He said, pure fucking magic. <laughs> and so, his words, not mine, uh, although I did repeat them, um, redact, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but that is why it's called PFM. But at the CIA, it's called WSFM. Have you all heard this term before? Uh, um, the first time I heard it, it was from the science director, a guy who's the, one of the top guys in the science director at CIA, who's actually been encouraged me to do what I've been doing for, since 1992, because he can't, because they'll get assassinated. So he says, you do it. If you get assassinated, who cares? Uh, <laughs> and so, so they use this term WSFM, sounds like a radio station. It stands for Weird Science and Frickin' Magic. And that is what they call this. Uh, and the Naval Research Lab people call it that. Because it, what it deals with is a type of phenomenon that when you get into a certain level of very high voltage systems, where the voltage is at a certain frequency and resonant field. And I'm not going to bore people with the arcana of this, but let's say you, you have a, a pointing vector or uh, you put an energy uh, field with, with very high voltage around an object that's a couple million volts. It's a very, very low amperage. So there's not much power involved, but at a certain cycles per second or hertz, resonant, and in specific resonant field, that object can be made to literally begin to resonate and then tilt out of linear space-time, and it will disappear. Now, I've been in a lab that's run near the Redstone Arsenal in Alabama, Huntsville, where I, this stuff has been done, and so by humans. <laughs> so, but, so it's disappeared. You can't see it. And it actually has moved into another dimension. Dimension 6, 10, 12, 80, 90, whatever it is. Someone asked me, how many dimensions are there? I said, how many numbers are there between 0 and infinity? Okay, so forget about 11 dimensions or it go, keeps going. So, uh, you know, it's like infinity goes back to infinity. We're going to get into this in a, in a later. Uh, and so the science behind this has really been studied somewhat accidentally in the early days by Faraday, uh, Maxwell, Tesla, and it was uh, sort of an empiricist understanding. You know, you know what empiricism is? Empiricism is basically observational, you know, uh, science. You, you observe something, uh, it's empirical, it's tangible. Now, you may not know the theoretical behind it, and this happens in science all the time. We'll, we'll see something and what we can describe the phenomenon and even the parameters of the science, but we won't understand really what it's doing. We still don't really understand how, uh, from the, the herb foxglove, um, a digitoxin works to increase the contra contractile strength of the heart muscle, but it's been used for 100 years. And it wasn't until very recently they understood how aspirin worked, which was from the, is the bark, from the bark of a tree, is where you get aspirin from. They didn't understand how that really works. And they still don't understand all of how it works, but it's, can, you can use it and empirically see how it works. But the understanding unfolds over sometimes decades, centuries, millennia. So I'm going to be talking about areas of science that is through a glass dimly, <laughs> and that there are certain phenomena that we can observe, but the actual full understanding of it is probably going to be unfolding over the next 1,000, 5,000, 500,000 years, the whole next cycle we're in. So that's, that's, I want to set the stage there. And the other part of setting the stage is the humility needed to sort of approaching a subject like this. Because the biggest mistake people make is to think, we know everything. I know everything because I'm a physicist at MIT. Well, actually, you know, not. It's like the guy, <laughs> it's like the guy who in the late 1800s declared that we could close the patent office because everything that could be invented had been. Now, this is a true story. <laughs> so, you know, there's this hubris that goes with the human condition that's rather worrisome, which has led to the foolishness that we see today called human society. But, 
But so to get past that foolish way of, of thinking, there has to be a very open mind uh, and also a willing to admit that we really don't understand but a tiny fraction of the cosmos around us. And the brightest and best amongst us in the working their whole lifetimes can only unfold a little bit of it. And so from that foundation of, of sort of a, a humility, then we can go and explore. And if we don't understand something, we can just file it and say, well, someday we may understand this. But don't discount it. Because it's often the things that are discounted because it's not fitting into the box of the current paradigm of science or religion or thought that gets chucked out. And that's where the good stuff is. Um, that's the really good stuff. And often, people who do begin to explore those things get persecuted. Like the University of Virginia. We have our farm out near University of Virginia. And there was a medical doctor who um, discovered that there was a bac bacteria, H. pylori, that causes a lot of the really bad bleeding ulcers. And it ran against the theory that it was just too much acid. And that if you took a course of this and that medicine instead of the acid medicine or with it, it would cure them without surgery or anything. He got run out of the country, ended up in Australia. Only, Australia was the only place he could get a job. He ended up getting the Nobel Prize. But, it, but the initial reaction of the scientific fundamentalist paradigm, the high priests of science, were to say, no, it can't be because we know everything about how this works. Well, it turns out they didn't know anything about how ulcers work. So the same is true in physics, the same is true in materials, and the same is true in, in theological thought and consciousness studies. So I think that's why we have to sort of enter this whole subject with that kind of perspective. Then you can at least begin to explore with, with something resembling an open mind uh, and, and learn something. The other thing to understand is that Almost everything that I'm going to talk about today has been known in some classified project or another for a very, very long time, it, but in pieces, maybe not put together this is the way I'm going to present it. My job is to sort of synthesize it and connect the dots, which is my job today is really to connect all these dots for you guys so that, so that you leave here understanding, wow, that's why an ET craft does that or that's why I had this experience in a contact moment, or that's what the future of energy and technology is going to be, uh, and, and a deep understanding. Now, what I will try to avoid is too much technical jargon, because this is, this is a, not a group of physicists, but, uh, and I'm just a country doctor from Virginia anyway, so we'll, we'll sort of avoid that's my line when I've done things at the Pentagon. I'm just a country doctor from Virginia. But you have to, uh, you know, feel in your heart that the knowledge can be understood, even if it's not in all the technical aspects, the concepts. So if you get the concepts, then you can move into what I call an operational paradigm. And the operational paradigm means that you can put together the phenomenon you see and your own experience and consciousness and thought and do something with it. Which, of course, the outgrowth of that is the CE5 initiative, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, where humans use consciousness and thought to interface with interstellar communication systems and make contact. And that's, that's the really exciting stuff. Let's start with some of the you know, observed phenomenon of these ET craft. You know, uh, if you go to uh, SeriousDisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com. So at SeriousDisclosure.com, we have five, six dozen military witnesses' testimony up there. We have the Orion Project links to all these sort of papers, but there's a lot of information from these witnesses of things that they observe, such as pilots who'd be flying along, and there would be a spacecraft off their wing, and it didn't just fly off. It dematerialized, quote unquote, instantly right there on, on radar and just vanished. 
Well, it's not like they were hallucinating, because it was on radar, and ground radar, and onboard radar. This is what happened also, by the way, with the famous Alaska case, where the Japan Airlines 747 Heavy was flying the polar route from Paris to Tokyo, carrying champagne and whatever else they carry on cargo jets uh, from Paris. Um, and they had this massive spacecraft appear. And it was the size of a battleship, but it was in the sky. And it actually was a CE-5 in the sense that the pilot signaled to it, put the, the landing lights on, and the craft signaled back. So there was, there was contact. A lot of people don't know that. You read the case of the captain, the Japan Airlines captain's account. Well, the, the, the spaceship, and this is all on our site and in the book Disclosure, the captain called in and had it on its radar. and called it in, and of course it ended up being on FAA radar, which we eventually, from John Callan, got the FAA tapes, and also a military radar. Military jets were scrambled. But this massive object did not move in a linear way. What do I mean by that? Well, it would be, say, at 12 o'clock, and instantly it would then be at 6 o'clock. This is something that was many times the size of 747. And it moved in this nonlinear way. And they could not understand it. First, they thought the radar was malfunctioning. That's what you go to immediately. Because, you know, normally you track, even if you're tracking, you know, a B-2 stealth or something that's supersonic, you're tr it's very linear. I mean, even four times the speed of sound is pretty slow. Or the space shuttle at 25,000 miles per hour is pretty slow. And track that thing. This is not trackable. <laughs> so in a linear way, because it would be here and then here. How? I'll we'll get to this. And oh, by the way, the same thing happened. Merle Shane McDowell, who's one of our witnesses, who was down here in Virginia at Norfolk at uh, Atlantic Command, and he was working under the Sink Atlantic Command, the Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Command, Admiral Harry Train. And they had a full, what's called full zebra alert, where basically, if you don't have a zebra stripe on your badge, you got to get out of the command center within 60 seconds or you're shot by the Marines who have the M16s there to enforce that. Now, I've been at this facility and in that area, and they, they mean business when you're in there. And so they went to full zebra alert. The admiral came down into his observation area in this, this huge facility, and they had this ET craft on radar off the coast of Newfoundland. Boom, one radar sweep. It'd be off the coast of South Florida. <laughs> one radar sweep, boom, it'd be right off the coast of Norfolk. And then it went off over to the Canary Islands, et cetera, and so on. They actually did scramble jets when it was in one area, I think up in the Northeast, and got close enough to take photos. All the photos got classified and put into the Black Pit of Calcutta, um, never to be seen again. But daytime, it was a daytime event. But the movement on the radar clearly showed that it was this very large, it's several hundred feet, they estimate maybe the size of a football field, circular object, and that's how it was moving. Now, this is not your granddad's Oldsmobile. Clearly not using a jet engine or a rocket or anything like that. So, you know, people say, what are the cases where you have proof of this? I said, well, we have the observation, we have the radar tapes, we have the documents, we have, what do you want? You know, but the, 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 what's behind the phenomenon is stop for a minute and say, how is it doing this? Well, it gets into what Einstein called the spooky effect. Everybody know what spooky effect is? Well, Einstein observed that a particle being could be in two places at once, like that, the same thing. And so he couldn't really explain it, but he just called it spooky, the spooky effect. And I guess it was spooky if you were linear in your thinking and teleologic and Einsteinian. But it's not spooky when you think about it. The whole cosmos is actually non-local because it's conscious. A few years ago, there was a journal uh, physics journal that published, and it was actually on the front page of Newsweek. It was back in the late 80s, early 90s, where they did a study, and what they were doing is that they were studying photons and shooting them down 
uh, 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 an area and there would, there would be an aperture or a window that it would go through. But what happened is that the physicists found that when they thought of where they were going to move, the photons changed course precognitively. In other words, the photons reacted with the thought and consciousness and intent of the physicist. And this was done over and over again and proven. And this was published in mainstream physics journals. But people say, oh, well, that's interesting. Well, I don't know what it means. They chucked it aside. Again, it's the cool stuff that gets chucked aside. This is in the mainstream physics journals. You look this study up. And then, of course, you have people like Dr. Bob John of Princeton, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, the Peer Lab. And back in the 90s, he and I spoke about this. He says, you know what you're doing out under the stars is, is sort of in a clinical, you know, experiential way what I'm proving in the lab. And that is that everything is conscious and everything can react to thought and consciousness. And so what he did at, at Princeton, he was professor emeritus of engineering, and some of his work has been continued by some of his, his students is that he would uh, have like a random number generator, like a, a, a machine that just generates, you know, zeros and ones or something like that. And they'd have someone just sit, and it wasn't like this was some psychic or, you know, somebody, it just ordinary people, and they would put their intention on it that it would, instead of putting out zeros, would put out more ones. And sure enough, the bell curve distribution would shift. Now, or the other way. But what was really cool about it, he then found that if there were two people who were really connected to each other, loved each other, where there was a heart connection, and did it together, the effect was exponential, 10 times greater. So what is that? And this, was, this is a mechanical system. It's just a thing spitting out zero in the random number generator. And this has been proven over and over and over and over and over again. Now, there's no linear contact between the person's body the physical, 3D, 4D, and the machine. It's just purely thought intending, and yet it affects it. What does this mean? Well, it means that everything is awake. Everything has within its structure an element of this non-local consciousness, mind that isn't bound to 3D space-time. And so non-locality is something that began to be talked about by physicists. And then there was a medical doctor, a man that I got actually met once, and he wrote a wonderful book called um, Recovering the Soul. And there was all these accounts of, 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 of scientists and also lay people finding that the mind and thought was always an omnipresent field and could have effects whether it was like an intercessionary prayer for someone, you know, one person would be in Europe, the other person in Hawaii, and they would have an effect, et cetera, and so on. Or they would take uh, saliva, which has, you know, your white blood cells in it, and they take it, you know, to another continent, keep it alive in a Petri dish, and they would put electrodes, and th those white blood cells would register when the person had an emotional reaction to something consistently, even though it was out of their body. Cool. I mean, this is the really cool stuff. So, if you, is everybody understanding this? You know, I haven't lost too many people yet. And what that means, the real kind of the bullet point is, the mind is always omnipresent. Your mind, my mind, all mind, because there's a singularity of mind. Erwin Schrodinger, the father of uh, modern uh, quantum, quantum mechanics, it was really particle wave theory back, I think it was 1908, said um, the total number of minds in the universe is one. That is, it's a singularity. So mind stuff or consciousness is a singularity. Now, we can be aware of our own awareness and think, well, I'm conscious and I'm Steve, and you attach it to yourself and your ego or your, your individuation, let's call it, your individuality. However, it's always at the same time on a, uh, uh, without any effort, whether you know it or not, 
tied into this sort of omnipresent, non-local field of consciousness, as it turns out, without effort. Now, you can be shut off from that, or you can be tied into it. The meditative state and samadhi is when you get tied into the universal component. That's all meditation is. It's the quieting of the individual mind to re-experience the non-local mind, the, the unbounded mind. And this actually has profound implications, not only for health and healing and contact, as we'll get to, but in physics. Because if you look at the cosmos, everything is, in fact, consciousness phasing and resonating as a photon or a star or a person or an individual or a tree. Now, this is not pantheism. It's an understanding that's a transcendent understanding of this sort of universality of the awake state, the, the awareness. And this has been proven scientifically. This is not, there have been study after study after study, some of which I'm citing here. I don't want to belabor the point. You can look these up yourselves. I'm sure you can all know how to read. Um, but I want to pull it together into sort of a, 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 a sort of a, a, an awakening within yourself for the fact that you're just not limited to your physical body and self, even when you think you are. We have one of our witnesses who's a Lockheed Skunk Works scientist, and um, you know what skunk works are? You know, the super secret skunk works up in the high desert. Uh, we're Ben Rich. He wrote the book Skunk Works, and um, before he passed away, he's the one who said, well, he said several things. One thing he said, there are no private conversations anywhere on earth. This was in the 90s, so he was way ahead of Edward Snowden. Um, <laughs> number two, anything you can imagine, we've already done at the Skunk Works. And number three, we already have the technologies to go travel amongst the stars. In fact, we can take E.T. home. <laughs> and the last thing he did in his slide was to show this, this black disc going out into space. And it was a, it was a human. It was a, it was a man-made uh, electromagnetogravitic EMG anti-gravity disc, which they have, and which we have had since October 1954 when we mastered gravity control. Um, so, <laughs> but the, the more profound thing is that people who've studied this begin to have experiences that are very, very strange. Because you can take these electronics and create this lifter effect of anti-gravity. So they're called lifters. And um, the way it is done is that you, at a high enough voltage with a counter-rotating field, you can cause lift. And this is if you go all the way back to the, uh, the uh, experiments of T. Townsend Brown, who, of course, ended up being the guy at the starting of the RAND Corporation. Um, his stuff went to the Air Force, went black. Um, or the Klosky Frost experiment in 1920, late 20s in Germany. They were doing things with crystalline structures, and they would create a high voltage field around them and found that, especially with crystals, they would kind of begin to resonate and expand, grow, or take up more space, and then they'd float and lift. 20s. 1920, I mean, before any of us were, I suspect between, before any of us were alive, I don't think there's anyone here who was alive in the 28 and 29 time period. Um, not even I. But, so, we have this amazing heritage that unfortunately has been confiscated into covert programs. But the people that I've dealt with, I now have 500, over 500 people I've met with, like the guys at Lockheed Skunk Works and Northrop and the agencies, three literary agencies, who've shared this with me, and the senior scientists here in the Naval Research Labs in DC, which is the largest Department of Defense lab, was in, quote, the vault and saw the documents that October 1954 is when we completed all the studies for gravity control. So we haven't needed rockets, jets, cars, trains, buses, trucks, ships on the ocean using combustible fuels or nuclear power since October 1954. Now, it was being studied before then for a couple of decades, but it was mastered. That's when they mastered gravity control. And what a shame it is. You look at the world, and we're destroying the world geopolitically and environmentally and every other way. 
because of this secrecy. And the secrecy is something that I understand but do not agree with. You have to understand it. You don't have to agree with it. And I understand it in a compassionate way. I mean, I talked to the colonel who was in charge of future technologies for the Air Force. Euphemism for not future, things we already have. It's, it's always a double speak when you deal with the military. Um, so this guy knew about this. And he said, you know, those things can be weaponized. I said, yes, you already have. They're already weaponized. I said, I can't tell you how many patients I took care of in the emergency department who were killed with knives, steak knives, butter knives. You can kill everything. I said, everything can be weaponized. The question is, do we let human society terminate fighting over the last barrel of oil and destroying the biosphere, or do we find a way to live together peacefully in an enforceable peace? Maybe it may be the peace of the chained dogs initially, because we're always going to be madmen out there but allow these sciences to come out so we don't cannibalize the earth. Because we're 100 years into a period when all, everything I'm telling you should have been known and out, at least in terms of the theoretical physics, the applied free energy materials should have been out in, by the turn of the last century, early 1900s, and the electromagnetic gravitics 50s, 40s and 50s, which of course Werner von Braun was working on with Adolf Hitler in Germany. That was their secret weapon. Um, we were doing the atomic bomb, they were doing anti-gravity. But we have this period in our, in our history right now where we've sort of gone past the red line of disclosure, where we should have had these things disclosed and put into peaceful application before I was born, because I was born in 1955. So I think that when we look at this, we have to say, you know, it's a little bit like the Gloria Steinem when she used to say, the, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> uh, love it. Uh, love it, love it, love it. Uh, but we, we're at, at this point, we're going to have to decide to make these changes. But first, we have to understand what we're dealing with here. Uh, and we really have to begin to understand the power of the conscious mind and these technologies and how they come together. Because when we're out there making contact with these civilizations, we're actually pulling together amazing science and technology, even though you may not fully understand, but the things that are happening are amazing. And therefore, the phenomena that can happen are amazing. And that's why you need this understanding, this scientific and intellectual understanding to understand the experience you will have or may have already had and didn't understand what happened when you had it like when you had that at the Outer Banks. Uh, that's why the, you know, the men who worked in these projects, and some of the women, um, like this guy at the Lockheed Skunk Works, he, he knew about some of this, but not all of it. He knew more about the, the just the more mainline anti-gravity stuff, or electromagnetic gravitic, because that's the proper term. Anti-gravity sort of a pop culture term. It's incorrect. It's not anti-gravity, it just creates a mass cancellation effect of an object so it floats. And if you cancel the mass enough, think about it. If you create a voltage around an object where the mass becomes less and less and less, what happens when the mass goes to zero? It disappears, correct. It vanishes to the eye and all detection systems and it's moved into another dimension. And it's in that state that it goes from this star system to another one. Get it? Does this make sense to people? Now I'm, this is beginning to make sense. So when these pilots and people come to me with the experience, now they're going to come with an empirical observation, and they don't have the background. I will try to explain to them what, why that 747 and this massive craft went from here to here and looked like it vanished, and, or the one that's going on your wingtip was hovering there, and all your instruments were going nuts on board, and it just dematerialized and vanished. It's, it, there's nothing metaphysical about it. It's an actual hard science, a very well understood hard science, but it's not something you can take at a course at MIT. So this is your MIT course. So <laughs> uh, for now, for now, someday, you know, this will be mainstream education, uh, I hope, soon. Uh, maybe not soon, but it, the sooner the better. 
the, bed, you know, the, the kids coming along need to understand this. This particular uh, scientist, getting back to his experience, the reason he called me up was not to tell me about the time he was operating a radar system and an ET craft came in and did all this amazing stuff, which is in the disclosure book. It was that he had an experience that he didn't understand, a personal experience. This is why a lot of these guys end up getting in, in touch with me. It's very funny. And I go, okay. So I'm on the phone. I think he heard me on a radio show or something. Or, and so he says, well, Doc, I was practicing a meditation discipline back in the 60s called uh, Roycecrucians or something like that. Yeah, the Roycecrucians. And he was trying to learn how to, what they call astrally project, where your body of light and consciousness sort of lifts up out of your physical body and flies around, like a lucid flying dream, but sort of on command instead of accidentally. And I said, oh, cool. You ever have any success with that? He says, yes. Let me tell you. <laughs> and, and he says, but it has to do with this issue. I said, oh, really? Uh, and so he said, well, I was there and I was trying too hard. He wasn't relaxing deeply enough. And so his teacher one day said, look, you know how to do this. You just need to let go and let it happen. And I guess he just, the right thing was said to him so he was able to do it. So he, he lay down on his bed and he was doing whatever technique they use. I'm, I've never taken that course. but. Um, he went out of his body, lifted up, and initially just kind of lifted up, and then he just, he got so excited, he went right up through, through the roof, the ceiling of the house, and into the sky, and into the atmosphere, and then slammed into the side of an extraterrestrial vehicle. Now he's fully lucid awake. And he said that, <laughs> he said that the, the ETs on board which were around four or five feet tall and very thin, no, ha no hair, were at some control and they were observing. And they were, they were hovering in the atmosphere, but not visible to the eye because they were shifted into this other dimension. And he, when he hit the spacecraft, the craft moved, but it was not his physical body, it was his astral body, the, the body of light that you fly around in. And he says, I don't understand how an interstellar vehicle, because he knew they existed, could be affected, I said, because it had shifted its resonant frequency beyond the crossing point of light, the speed of light and matter and electrons into a dimension that is closely approximates the astral body field, that energy field that the mystics called astral. And since it was of a similar density to your own, it could interface with it. The funniest part of the story after he said, oh, I've wondered my whole life how that could have happened. Um, he popped inside, and they looked at him like, my God, why don't you watch where you're going? You know, I said, mm -hmm. they did. It was like, it was kind of like appalled at this interstellar faux pas. And uh, they're like, well, you can watch where you're going. You know, how many people have had a flying dream where you, it's like full color and you're flying along? All right, that's your astral body. And the mystics called your astral body. But it's actually part, it's, it's part and parcel woven into your physical body, but you can have experiences where it separates. Um, and you can travel through that modality. So other places, other dimensions. And um, this has been done for thousands of years. There's many, many accounts in the literature about people doing this. And many people will confuse that with their actual physical body because it, it looks very similar in shape and size. But then within that astral body is the sort of the, the essence of your, your self, your thought essence. And then within that is pure consciousness. So if you look at it, every single individual human being has folded within them all the dimensions of the cosmos. So when people say, how do I explore and find these other dimensions? I said, they're already folded within you. They're there. It's just that we're, you just need to have someone explain that that's what that is. Um, so anyway, so this uh, military, the Skunk Works guy, the Lockheed Skunk Works, was very happy to finally figure out <laughs> what happened. But then we had this discussion, and I said, you know, this has you know, really profound implications for you understanding what's going on at Dreamland MOC. And you know what Dreamland MOC is? Uh, Dream, okay, so it's in, I, have, I brought with me the the thing I put together when Obama got elected. And the very first document in this, uh, this briefing 
is the one from Nellis Air Force Base, you know, what the public call Area 51. Nobody calls it that. And it talks about the Dreamland MOC in it, Dreamland, and uh, all the different, different compartments uh, out at that facility. And the reason there was an area called Dreamland is that when the pilots who were piloting these anti-gravity devices, and they were taking them to the edge of the crossing point of light, all right, to the, right to the edge of going beyond the light barrier resonantly, there is this phenomenon of beginning to dematerialize, and you find that you have shifted your body and the craft and everything in it, and it feels like a lucid dream, when you're awake in a lucid dream. And that's why it was called Dreamland, Military Operating Center, MOC. And a lot of people always wonder how they got Dreamland. Uh, so the, now you know, and, but the, this is something that if you begin to look at, if you do an ethnography of different cultures, for example, the aboriginals in Australia, where they have something called dream time. And I know a man who worked for ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence and State Department. His cover was State Department, it was really ONI. Um, and he went over there to study this. And so he went out into the outback, this was back in the 70s, I think. And he kind of embedded himself with a group of aboriginals who were still in touch with that ability and they were talking to him about dreams. So, you know, one night they, you know, were in some encampment and they were very nomadic, went to sleep. And one of the members of, of the tribe, uh, one of the aboriginals uh, the next morning said, oh, well, I had uh, a very lucid, in, in the dream, I met uh, some, uh, so-and-so, I don't know the person's name, and we're going to, we need to walk, da-da-da-da-da, and meet at whatever time here. And, of course, this guy who was a State Department slash Naval Intelligence person studying this weird high strangeness uh, didn't quite believe it. And so they started trekking, trekking, trekking. And sure enough, at the exact place and time, they, he met this person who, and they didn't have cell phones, nothing. And they just met. And he said, this is, you know. So it was one of these things where this is their normal state. And many African tribes have, have, have described doing this, and Native American peoples, and you know, they, they call them seers or visionaries. But it's really this, just the capability of the conscious mind to be disciplined to in the dream state, wake, sleep state, to awaken into this dream, and then be in control while you're having it. That's the lucid part, and begin to explore. And you can explore things in this world or other worlds that way. Now, really what we do when we do the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind protocols is that we're going into deep meditation and doing it consciously. You know, we're not going to sleep. Well, some people go to sleep because we're out till 2 in the morning. But we're doing this uh, through a technique, a meditative technique and a protocol, which, you know, you can all um, uh, use and, and practice. And practice makes perfect, I'll tell you. You need to practice it for it to really work effectively. But the concept is what you need to understand. How does it work? Well, if you're talking about connecting to an interstellar civilization, they may or may not be in the area and not in this linear dimension. Maybe they're dematerialized and they're hovering over the White House. Could be. Why not? Who would detect it? Nobody would detect it if it shifted far enough out of this dimension. But it could pop into view instantly. So it's not just that they're traveling faster than the speed of light. They can be shifted beyond the speed of light and be, quote, stationary, but kind of superimposed around this space, but beyond 3D space. Does that make sense? So it could be in this room. It could be anywhere. Now, the effect, it becomes something that doesn't make a lot of sense to people unless they understand the, the basics basic concepts I'm, I'm sharing now. And then you say, well, what happens when it's only partially here? So let's say a, there's a spacecraft and it's not quite 3D, but it's near, but it's shifting, it's bumping up against the fabric of space-time. 
Well, this is where you get all kinds of epiphenomena, all kinds of other phenomena, such as electromagnetic signals coming through our systems that we detect, um, a sphere that floats right by us out in the desert, which happened at Joshua Tree a few years ago, stopped and we heard four voices speaking in the desert, in clear air, empty, we had night scopes. And then all of a sudden we took a photograph and here's this extraterrestrial we call Bijou, who's from the Andromeda galaxy, who's there waving, it's on the website, okay? That's how that happened. But it actually, so the, the understanding of this, it's really, key to going out and doing the contact protocols. Because you're using consciousness, but you're also using thought and electromagnetic systems, and all of this is coming together in a nexus. And there can be all degrees of the manifestation or how something materializes. It can be 3D, where you really would bump into it solid, or it may look like it's 3D, but you could walk right through it. Wonderful story from Altus uh, in Air Force Base, a friend of ours who lives out in the mountains. He worked for the Air Force back in the 60s, and he was a guard at a nuclear bomb squadron out in Oklahoma. And if you read his account, it's very interesting because there was a roughly a chevron or triangular-shaped object that was cobalt blue, gorgeous, that came into, and they were investigating our uh, nuclear capabilities. I think this was in 1968. I have to look it up. Uh, but it's in the testimony. You can look. But what was interesting is that he said it was translucent cobalt blue. It wasn't solid. But you see the shape of it, but it wasn't fully like that. Does that make sense? So it moved over, and of course they have what they call the hot areas that are marked off in red. No one can go into those hot areas except the, the pilots for the nuclear uh, bombers. And of course, these were hot, ready to go. They were kept ready to go all the time in those days. Um, and we still have some that are hot, ready to go. But the hot areas were, and they had sensors, electromagnetic sensors. Well, as this thing moved across that area, it set the sensors off. So even though it wasn't 3D, totally physical, it, visually you could see this outline of this cobalt blue ship. And it was enough in this dimension to put off electromagnetic fields that the electronic sensors went off, which ended up being a disaster because they went to a full alert and had to scramble those jets and move them off the base, which is what happened. But the craft was never 3D, fully 3D. Does this make sense? So many times people will see something and they'll go, well, I saw it, but I'm not sure. And in fact, that's how this guy approached me. I'm not sure what I, and I said, well, just describe it. Don't editorialize it. And he described it. I said, oh, well, I know exactly what that is. That was a craft of that shape and dimension that was still shifted. Its molecular and atomic structure resonant field was still shifted high enough that it wasn't totally 3D, but you could see the glow and outline of it, kind of like an astral body or a ghost. Cool stuff, huh? Is this too much information too quickly? Okay, so um, we're gonna have a whole hour and a half of question and answer for later anyway, so make notes on your little tablets or whatever you wanna do if you have questions that come to your mind. The reality is when we're observing ETs, their physical bodies can also do the same thing. So if you look at this ET we call Bijou that, that appeared at uh, Joshua Tree National Park, we're probably gonna do a, a week training there in April if you wanna come. Uh, we go to this place, it's amazing, in the heart of this 800,000 acre park. And um, was that with the naked eye, nothing was seen. Now the ears could hear four ETs speaking. I don't know what language they were speaking. Andromedan, I don't know. Um, but when the person took the photo, Raven, a member of our team, took the photo, she, she just held her breath and had the, it open for three or four seconds, and here is this glowing field of energy and this being standing there, turned like this, waving at us. And on the top of his head, if you look very carefully, is what looks like a, a yarmulke. It's not, I don't think he's Jewish. Uh, <laughs> it might be. Uh, 
It was a rabbi from Andromeda. No. <laughs> but, uh, but it's this thick, it's about this, it looks about that thick, and it's a white, uh, and it's a, t basically a teleportation de assisting device. So it holds that field. So the f their physical body can phase in and out of 3D or 5D, 10D, whatever, resonantly shifting. Make sense? I'm looking around to see if I've lost everyone yet. Because uh, understanding all of this, I'm trying to give examples of things that are really big lessons to understand when you're going to go out into the stars with your team in Largo or wherever, or California or wherever you're from. Uh, now, the other more fascinating part of this is that interstellar civilizations utilize what I call coherent thought thought emanating from a deep level of quiet mind that's very directional, very specific, the way we would utilize a laser and a laser disc or a fiber optic system with lasers or, you know, a laser tracking system. There's a really hilarious story I, I like to share about meeting with the CIA director for Bill Clinton out here at a dinner party some years ago, about 20 years ago. and. Um, of course, the interest was policy. Why the hell aren't we telling? Why the hell isn't the president being told what's going on? Why are they lying to us? I'm the CIA director, and I don't know nothing about this. And so we got through all that, and then we got into more of a relax. It was almost three hours we were together. My wife was with me, and um, the the wife of the CIA director was the chief operating officer of the National Academy of Sciences um, over here. In so she had a really scientific mind, whereas the CIA director was more policy, um, secrecy, policy, all that, and basically upset and mad because they had looked into the issue and knew they were being lied to, which is what, of course, the, all, the whole Clinton team knew that, and so did Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter famously said, I didn't have a high, en I didn't have a high enough security clearance to be told about this even though he had had a sighting as governor uh, of Georgia. But <laughs> so she basically said, well, I don't understand. How could they be communicating from one star system? Let's say they're from a star system way out there, and they're trying to communicate with a craft that's here, one of these UFOs that's here. They, how could they possibly do that? Because the electromagnetic field is uh, the, uh, the speed of light. You know, that's what your cell phone is, radios, 186,000 miles per second, speed of light. And I said, yes, I know, the speed of light is just too damn slow, isn't it? <laughs> I said, well, they're not. They're using a phased electromagnetic system that goes beyond the crossing point of light. And by the way, the chief scientists in Naval Research Lab said they have done experiments at NRL here that have done signals beyond the speed of light, but it is classified. He sat in my condo here and told me this word for word. Number three at the whole lab. He sits in on meetings with the vice president. I mean, I know this guy, this guy stayed at our home. This is real. So, but she didn't know about this because she was an administrator at the National Academy of Sciences. And I said, well, you know, my first thought was if I tell her the truth about this, she's gonna think I'm a crank and a kook, and, you know, I'm a young doctor, I'm only 35 or you know, something, and I have four children I've got to put through college, I said, I'm going to ruin myself if I tell her the truth, and, uh, but I thought, well, you know, she asked me the question, and I owe her an honest answer, and uh, so I said, look, she, you've asked, but just bear me out, I said, you know, let's take our Milky Way galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. So this, if a beam of light went across at 100, 186,000 miles every second, it would take 100,000 years to reach the other side. That's just our galaxy. And in our galaxy is about 100 billion star systems, same number of star systems that there are neurons in our brain. Cool, huh? Interesting coincidence. And let's, so let's just say there's a civilization that is one thousand year, light years from here, a 
light year is a distance, not time measurement, a distance measurement. It's the distance light goes at 186,000 miles a second in a year. So let's say it's 1,000 light years from here, which is 1% of the way across the Milky Way galaxy, which means it's in our neighborhood, because we're not even intergalactic now. Um, at the speed of light of your cell phone, a radio wave, a TV signal, a fiber optic, it's going to take 1,000 years for the signal to get from that home planet to their starship that's in our solar system, and another 1,000 years for the starship to say, hi, got your message, how are you doing today, to go back. It's the time since the birth of Christ to so say hello and goodbye. <laughs> it's, not an, it's not a functional paradigm. So a priori, if you're interstellar, you are transdimensional. Then what does that mean? It means that your communication gear, as well as your transportation gear, is dropping out of linear space-time in a non-locality, a field of non-locality. Now, the ultimate field of non-locality is pure mind stuff, the essence of awareness. But that's absolute non-locality. But between the absolute field of non-local, pure, undifferentiated consciousness and 3D or a countless numbers of gradations of relative non-locality. And they may not be instant, but they're pretty damn fast, and they're certainly faster than the speed of light. Is this making sense to people? Okay, stay with me. So this means that they have electronic devices that are, when they're fully materialized 3D, have electronics that can pick up on directed thought and transmit directed thought. And I'll never forget Dr. Robert Woods, who is uh, one of our witnesses from uh, McDonnell Douglas, telling me a story, an old man McDonald. Um, I know this from two sources, Lawrence Rockefeller, who was very interested in all this, um, and who funded the original Project Starlight effort. If you, the AP had this whole release of Project Starlight documents from the Clinton Library. It was a big scandal a couple years ago. And we were putting all this stuff together, and Lawrence Rockefeller was involved, and his lawyer, uh, Henry Diamond, and all these big folks. And I was putting together all this stuff. And he funded the first uh, gathering of witnesses at uh, Silomar near Monterey in California in 1995. And we had KGB people there, and cosmonauts, and astronauts, and everybody. And what was interesting is that uh, this whole group of people kind of understood this area of thought and consciousness, but not too technically. And uh, what, what we discovered was, was that through going back, this was I believe in the mid-60s, McDonnell Douglas was very interested in this. And old man McDonald himself was like, oh, I've got to know about this. So Dr. Woods, who is a very renowned aerospace guy, um, was sent to research all this stuff, anti-gravity, UFO sightings, all this stuff. And he came back with this amazing case of a very high caliber case, where I think it was in the Baja, California, where a craft had materialized, and this was back before we had systems to track them so well and hit them with electromagnetic weapons, which is what's happening today. We'll get to that. Um, and this little being came out and it had a, like a little black box thing here. And it was obviously the communication device. And the people who had the encounter said that basically the ET was, it was communicating directly into their neural cortex, and maybe auditory cortex, with this thing in thought. And that when they would think back to the being, they wouldn't have to speak, he would understand it and receive it. And so it was a, if you will, a, a thought transponder instead of a radio transponder. And now, this sounds like science fiction, but it isn't. It's the only thing that can explain how you're going to scientifically and reliably be able to have a communication system that is from one star system or galaxy to another in real time. Again, spooky effect, two things at once, boom. So you're, you're, you're dropping out of the linear barrier of space 
and it's basically space is obliterated, if you wish, to look at it that way, so that it, it's all right here. You can be a billion light years away and it's still right here because of the non-local effect of consciousness and understanding that other aspects of reality have a conscious component, including photons, electrons, and electromagnetic signals. There's a carrier wave of thought stuff, consciousness stuff, even within an electromagnetic signal. Get it? That's why the CE5 initiatives actually do work. Um, and when I explained some of this, finally the, the wife of the CI director said, oh, I thought it had to be something like that. <laughs> what was her response? I said, yeah, of course, you're a smart lady. I mean, it makes sense. Now, impolite company, a polite scientific company, one's not allowed to talk about these things because it's, it's, it's a, a forbidden. This is like, oh, my book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, that the film series was based on. These are things you're just not allowed to talk about because it's so paradigm busting scientifically and even theologically because it begins to explain a lot of quote mystical experiences people have had that become a catechism or get misinterpreted through the millennia. But ultimately, if we want to seek the truth, let's find the truth and forget our dogma. I love that saying, my, you know, my, my karma ran over my dogma or something like that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, you know, it, that's really, you know, the, the pure-hearted pursuit of the truth, no matter where it takes you, um, is really, really key when you're going into these uh, emerging sciences and, and areas of thought and consciousness. This then brings us to the numbers of people who have observed these kinds of phenomenon in the mainstream, where they will have an object, a sphere appear, and then inside the sphere floating into their house are these little beings in the sphere communicating in their thought. A very famous actor who I've spent time with his, at his home in LA had this happen. Didn't think any of this was true. And then, of course, he, he found out who I was, bought all the books, and he said, oh, my God, this is why this happened, because he read the first book that I wrote, Extraterrestrial Contact, The Evidence and Implications. It came out in 99. Most people don't get to that book. It's really probably the most important one. Um, and what was fascinating is that he said, now I understand it. So he, he contacted me, and I went to his home, and um, we were sitting where this happened, and then went out on his balcony, which overlooked um, uh, Silver Lake Reservoir there in LA. And um, oh, he's up in the hills. And here comes this object, it comes straight down out of space, a yellow golden object, comes down, goes and goes in front of a cloud and then dematerializes. He goes, oh, did you see that? I go, yeah. I said, they know we're talking. I'm sure these are the same people who came into your house. Wonderful, lovely. So uh, I think that a lot of people have had these experiences, but they don't have the understanding. My hope for, for this gathering today, but also the, the, the video that we'll put out, is that people will begin to connect these dots and make some sense of these experiences, where uh, in the early days when I started looking into this, I found there were many, many accounts where people would see a craft or maybe it's not fully materialized, maybe it's just a sphere, and they'll think something, and it'll react to the thought. And people are, how is it doing that? It was reading my mind. Well, I mean, it's not Kreskin reading your mind. There is a science of, of what I call coherent thought receivers and transmissions that can take place between trans-dimensional interstellar capable civilizations and humans. Now, we may not understand all the science, and I can't say I can go to my a laboratory and build one of these things, because I can't hook up my DVD player. Emily has to do that. I'm a, useless with that kind of thing. You know, he's like, nurse, or Emily, help. You know, but um, the fibrillator's great, and respirators, and other stuff. For, no, computers hurled them through the window. Um, I'm all thumbs. But, you know, it, it, we can understand it. So then, from an experiential point of view, from that paradigm, we can say, oh, I understand now 
how it is contact can be initiated, but also if it spontaneously begins to happen, how it begins to unfold and why it can be both physical and in thought and electronic uh, and then in these other phenomena. I call it the epiphenomenon that happens, all the different manifestations of contact. We're sitting out in the desert in the middle of an 800,000 acre park. There are no police around. There's no microwaves or no McDonald's. Um, there are no big microwave ovens. And we have magnetic field meters and radar detectors and other things that aren't expensive, but that we have in our, uh, our toolkit. And we're sitting there and we'll see an object. It'll look like a, a flash bulb going off in space. It's just an object that turns on and turns off. And sometimes it'll move and turn on and turn off. And one time we had like 15 of them that were right above us doing this that we filmed. This actor actually came out with us in, near Palm Springs and we did this. And then the detectors start talking. But they're making sounds that the people, if you contact the people who manufacture it, the factory, go, these don't make these sounds. And they're actually doing trans-dimensional communication through the electronics. So forget the Arecibo telescopes and the SETI project spending hundreds of millions of dollars. You can go to Radio Shack, get a radar detector, a magnetic field meter, tri-field meter, and a couple other things, s put it out, sit in meditative state, and then welcome them to come, and all kinds of things can start happening. And what is, what is it? How do you interpret that, though? It becomes very intuitive because, uh, and what, you, what we have found with some of our equipment, certain things will make certain tones, like we have one radar detector we call Walter, because a man named Walter gave, gave, it, gave it to us. And it will do a certain type of beeping. It will beep, beep, beep three times, and only three times. It doesn't make the sound like you would with a, radar, with a cop car or, or a radar gun. Just when an object is about to appear, and then within moments, there'll be a, a sighting of a, an ET object. It would beep, 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 and it means we are here. Um, and there, so it gets, you get into this flow, and they actually do what I call a uh, trans-dimensional entrainment of the circuitry of your device. It gets customized after a period of weeks and months, years. And uh, they really will communicate uh, in ways that are quite mysterious, quite bizarre. People who come on these whole week thing expeditions with me, they, you know, they go, what the hell is going on? I said, well, just listen and interpret for yourself. But, there's a, but there is a pattern to it that evolves. So you have objects that can materialize, objects that can be quasi-materialized, that are like the cobalt blue object at that Air Force Base. You can have spherical objects that will have the entities in them. You can have an object that appears and then dematerializes, and then all you hear is some voices speaking. You take a photograph, and there's this guy waving at you. This is why it's WSFM, weird science and frickin' magic. And everyone is oriented towards very materialistic, linear, tw early 21st century manifestations, because that's what we want. And I'm saying, what a mistake. That's a huge mistake. Because what they're really wanting us to do is to understand their universe, their cosmos, and go partially into that. Because it's edifying. That's how you learn. You don't learn by having everything spoon-fed you at the level that you're already operating. Does this make sense? Hard lesson, because people are lazy. And humans tend to be kind of slovenly, mentally. It was a Yogananda that said it's the lack of spiritual adventuresomeness <laughs> that keeps uh, humanity back. Um, so there's a sense of adventuresomeness and exploration, and, and, and these civilizations understand that we need to be kind of willing to step, while we're in this planet and in this dimension, step partially into their understanding of what it's like on their planet, where Using thought to interface with an electronic device is as common a thing as we would be texting someone with our cell phones. But remember, a few hundred years ago in Salem, Massachusetts, if you had a, a smartphone, you'd be burned at the stake as a witch. 
It'd be witchcraft. It'd be magic. So that's why, you know, if we're really looking at this, and instead of looking backward, if we want to look forward into where our civilization's headed, we need to take these lessons to heart and begin to practice it within that paradigm. And that's what we're encouraging people to do through these CE5 Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind teams. Very, very exciting, because as you begin there, we have an app um, that's at the uh, app stores. It's for both uh, iPhones and also uh, Google um, that you can get that has the whole meditation technique. It'll actually turn your phone into a magnetic field meter. It does all this stuff. It's a whole course. It's a huge file. You have to use your computer to download it. It's so big. But um, I encourage people to get that. We have people who've done that, gotten that, and if you were in all kinds of remote areas of the world. Uh, and that, now that's separate from the, the app, the free app that lets you network with people in your area. That's the ET contact networking app. This is the training app. And, uh, but it's only like $6.99, and it has like a zillion things in there. For, and I encourage people to get that because if you can't come on a whole week expedition with me, and those are limited to 20 people, so let's face it, not many people can, but you can get that, practice it, find some people in your area, and go out and begin to do it. And when you go out and begin to practice it, then you realize, wow, this works. And people, people I, we've heard from so many people go out and try it, and they go, we had an amazing object. We had an amazing sight, and we had this thing come right into the field with us. Uh, and, it, and the reason it works is that it's so simple because the simplicity of it, even though what I'm giving you is more of a deeper theoretical and physics understanding of it, everyone's conscious, right? <laughs> well, unless you're in a coma. And everyone can think. And so if you are sentient, if you have the ability to be aware and awake, you can become aware of awareness. And in that self-aware state, you can go into the silence of deep, quiet mind. And in that state, begin to remote view and see distant places, including where the ET craft are. And they may be under, under the ground underneath you. They may be transposed in the air around you. They may be on the far side of Saturn. It doesn't matter where they are because there's no limitation in space when you go into thought consciousness that goes beyond space-time. So that's where the, the meditative state is so key. And if you begin to understand what's full, you know, there's this wonderful saying from the, I think it's a Sufi tradition, thinkest thyself a puny form when within thee the universe is folded. It's a rhetorical question. So we think of ourselves as just these little animals running around, but the truth is every conscious being has the ability to be aware of the awareness itself and from that point explore anywhere and travel anywhere, see any place. And, you know, human history is replete with people who've had these experiences, many times quite spontaneously. I think almost everyone has had how many people here have had a precognitive or an intuitive uh, experience of something that then happened in their life at some point? Yeah, I met my wife that way in a lucid dream. And I think that what you find, it, <laughs> it really did, and, and, but what you find is that this is something that is innate to every human being. It's not like you have to be, um, well, uh, this guy I knew for years, Ingo Swan. You know who Ingo Swan is? Very famous remote viewer, did a lot of stuff for the intelligence community, lived to regret it. But I was at his home up in New York um, some years ago, and um, just a wonderful man, brilliant. And you know, he did a lot of work with SRI, Stanford Research International, um, and DARPA, and um, Army Intelligence, and CIA. And they were experimenting and training people during the Cold War to be able to use consciousness to spy on the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union was doing the same thing. Um, and everyone in the intelligence community at a certain clearance level knows about this, by the way. This is nothing, you know, all that secret. It's hidden in plain sight. Um, but what was interesting to me was that, you know, he regretted that he ended up being used that way eventually. But what he and I would talk about together is, is the fact that every single human being has the ability to do this. They just don't do anything to help develop it. 
So it's like, you don't st start out in kindergarten doing quantitative analysis and calculus. There's a process, right? It's the same thing with these capabilities. Um, you know, I bench press 410 pounds. Well, you don't start out that way. You rip your, you know, pectoralis muscles in half. So you, you, so everything is an iterative learning, developing process of skill and knowledge and experience that builds on itself over time. Most people just never take the time to sit down two, three times a day, go into a quiet meditative state, and then practice the ability to intend to know. And I call it the intend to know because it's not brute will. It's quietly going into consciousness and then saying, I want to know this. I want to see this place and let it open very subtly. It's a very subtle, um, integrative process as opposed to a brutal intellectual one. My own approach to this is a very Vedic one. And as you know, the ancient Vedas, people conflate the Vedas with Hinduism. They have really very little to do with each other. The, the, the Vedic knowledge predates any known, it's a philosophy. But Vedanta is really the study of the consciousness in its singularity. And that's, of course, from that, the concept of the human experiencing that state, which is called samadhi or nirvana. Um, but there's this misunderstanding in the public that only certain adepts, you know, that you have to lay on a bed of nails for 30 years and, you know, do all kinds of crazy stuff to be able to have this happen. It simply isn't true. Uh, every single human being can learn to sit quietly, go into a meditative state using whatever works for you. I use a type of mantra meditation. Um, it can also be a breathing technique with mantra. There are a lot of approaches to it. The key thing is for the mind to become quiet, centered, and allow it to become very deeply centered. And at the point where all thought and awareness of everything disappears, but you're not asleep, you're still awake, it may just be a flash. That's the samadhi state. It's the experience of pure consciousness without differentiation. That's the state of pure non-locality. At that point, you are omnipresent. You're everywhere. And it is at that point that if you begin to pra practice and experience that, you can stay very steady state in your awareness and then intend, while still being very quiet, to see or know something that's remote, like where a starship is, or what's going on at home in your kitchen. In my misspent youth, Instead of doing drugs and chasing skirts, I was spending eight hours a day meditating, doing Vedanta when I was in my late teens and early 20s. And um, I had some experiences that taught me that this was really easy to do <laughs> because I just said, I want to learn how to do this. And I, 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 notwithstanding the fact I was raised a, a very devout atheist, I mean, we're <laughs> very uh, the catechisms of atheism um, didn't fit in the test tube didn't exist end of discussion uh, but uh, at the most agnosticism but after my near-death experience and when I was 17 um, I had an experience of that state of mind it was beautiful it was this supernal state I'll never forget it uh, and I said well I really want to learn how to arrive at that state of deep peace and quiet and oneness, if you want to call it that, it's sort of universal oneness, um, without having to die or, you know, or have a, something terrible happen to me, which is what happened, and then have a near-death experience. So I did. So I learned meditation. And uh, it was very comical because I, here I am. It was on my 18th birthday. And I, I only tell this story, not in any self-aggrandizing way, but just to give you a sort of a, a sense of how people entrain themselves to make things difficult when they shouldn't. So I didn't know that it was supposed to be so easy. I didn't know that it was supposed to be so hard. So I accepted it was natural and easy. So my teacher did the whole thing, and they, he initiated me, and I sat down, and I immediately went into this deep, deep, deep meditation, and I transcended into samadhi. And afterwards, he was looking at me, sort of appalled. He says, you transcended, didn't you? I said, isn't that what we were supposed to do? <laughs> and I was, 
I didn't know that I was supposed to make this big gashry about it, you know, and, you know, make this big deal and have to waste 30 years doing something that you can do in 30 minutes. So that's another lesson. It, you know, you need to sort of affirm to yourself, A, this can be done, and B, you can do it. If you think you can't do it, you won't. But if you say, of course, I'm awake now, why can't I close my eyes, or even with my eyes open eventually, be able to be in touch with the mind that is this omnipresent field. What Ern Schrodinger said, the total number of minds in the universe is one. It's a singularity. So if you affirm to yourself you can do it, you will be able to do it. If you sit there with the little gremlin on your ego shoulder saying, I can't do it, I won't do it, I'm not Ingo Swan, I'm not the, you know, blah, 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 poor me. Well, you're not. It's like, you know, a doctor trying to put a chest tube in. If I, if I have to put a chest tube in here because he's just been run over by a Mack truck and he's got a hemothorax, and I'm going, I can't do this. I, well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to lacerate all the nerves in his whatever before I get into where I need to be. So there's a certain amount where you have to, to give yourself a break <laughs> and say, I can do this because I'm awake. And go back to some experience in your life that's been intuitive or some experience in your life where you've experienced a lucid dream and then the next day it happened and begin to re recall these experiences where you go, I do have this aspect of the mind within me that is omnipresent. And I can go to that place and use it for good and to see things in real time that are going on now at distant places, but also I can see things into the future or if I need to, into the past. Why? Because consciousness transcends not only linearity of space, it transcends the flow of time. And that's the, that is, solves the mystery of the precognitive lucid dream. Now the Cherokee, I'm a quarter Cherokee, my grandmother was Cherokee Indian, and, I, and their tradition is a big tradition of lucid precognitive dreaming, like at the Hopi, which I just learned actually were the people who, uh, the Anasazi who disappeared, um, uh, became the Hopi. And they would have these experiences of precognitively seeing the future in the dream state and in vision quests. And what, what you find is that that's something you can do also. Most of the very important close encounters of the fifth kind, um, where we were going to set out to own an expedition to a foreign country or someplace, a week before it would happen. Sometimes more than one of the people I was going to travel with would have a dream of an event that would happen and where the place looked like, even though it was a place we'd never been. And it would be crystal clear. It may just be a flash. It may just be an instantaneous flash. It may be in that hypnagogic state, you know, the state in between waking and dreaming. That's a great time to practice this once you learn the science of consciousness, which I'm introducing you to here very quickly. So I went from aircraft sightings to this stuff. But this is what's really exciting. And at that point, you go, wow, I can be in that relaxed state going in and out of meditation, but also in and out of sleep and see a distant place, but also perhaps see a point in the future caveat. Anything that's in the future can only be a probable future. If it's in the past, it's kind of in chrysalis. It's there. It's in the Akashic record. It's there. If it's in the future, it's subject to change depending on what everyone, including yourself, thinks and does. And this is why when people say, on December blah blah of this year, X, Y, and Z is going to happen, I immediately know they're a charlatan. Because if they get that fixed in their predictions about soothsaying into the future, they don't understand the nature of reality and that it's this organic, evolving phenomenon that is subject to the thoughts and the actions of even those who have heard your prediction, including yourself. You know, it's sort of like the Heisenberg, on, I'm sorry, it's sort of a psychic Heisenberg principle. But, um, so that is something you have to understand, that it may be 95% likely, 80% likely, 99.9% .9 likely, but not 100% if it's off the, the now. Now, if it's in now in real time and you become accurate, boom, it's there now, be here now, or if it's in the past. But when we're doing CE5 contact work, normally we do preparation before we go out, 
So I encourage people to practice this precognitive capability before we go out that night, for example. Uh, and I encourage people on their teams to do it. And then, but when you're there in real time, you're observing with your conscious mind and inviting these civilizations to come visit in real time, uh, if they can, and if it's safe and everything, uh, if it's an appropriate group. Uh, and we always do this within the context of not dolphins at sea world jumping through hoops for us and entertaining us. We do it within the context of genuinely wanting to be ambassadors or emissaries from Earth and humanity to these civilizations without prejudice. So it's sort of um, a global diplomatic core of interstellar travelers, that's what we're developing, um, who, who understand uh, to get out of the sort of the the orthodoxy and catechisms of conventional ufology, 99% of which is rubbish, um, and to step into being in a higher state of consciousness, making contact with these civilizations without fear and without prejudice about who they are and where they've come from, or even perhaps what they've done in the past, because the past cannot... It, <laughs> let's look at it this way. No matter how you view these civilizations, the future is always different from the past, and we create the future now. Just remember that. Very important. I mean, a generation ago, they were dropping atomic bombs on Japan and blowing up every city in Germany. Now they're our closest allies. So humans need to learn to get out of the us versus them xenophobia. They have this sort of the negative end of atavistic proclivities. So that, uh, returning to this sort of primitive monkey troop fighting, murderous, rampaging, monkey routine. Because we, we can't afford that. Not with nuclear weapons and not with weapons that have been developed from studying extraterrestrial technologies, which are a million times more powerful than a hydrogen bomb, which we have already. Scalar electromagnetic weapons. So that, that means that there need to be a core of us who are willing to put ourselves out there to be sincerely, with a pure heart, and without fear or prejudice, ambassadors to these civilizations, because they are out there. And you know what? They're waiting. These civilizations, I think they've been less than pleased with, so far, the response on balance that humans have had towards them, uh, because it's either been denial, or fear, or xenophobia, or f frank hostility. I mean, the Roswell event was actually an electromagnetic system going off that caused these two craft that hit each other and collide and crash. A lot of people don't know that. It's just an FBI document that pretty much states that, that it was a new radar dome. Well, the radar dome had a, some sort of Tesla coil type electromagnetic 1947, circa 1947 electromagnetic pulsed. And these two craft that were seeing what we were doing at the 509th Bomb Squadron, which was the only nuclear bomb squadron, in the atomic bomb squadron in the, in the world at the, at the time, they weren't nuclear bombs and they were atomic. You know the difference, atomic, nuclear? Atomic is fission, nuclear is fusion. Anyway, um, anyway, but it was an atomic bomb squadron, the only one. And they turned this thing on, boom, and these two craft that were going along, one sort of exploded right there northwest of Roswell. The other one descended and kind of cracked in half or broke up uh, near Socorro. And that's where they got the ET that was alive out of it, the, what they called the EB. So there are two ships. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that was a, a terrible event. It was a violent event. Um, so a lot of people have said, well, the, can't the ETs avoid that if they have all these abilities? I said, no. Not just because, just because they have advanced technologies does not make them omniscient. So here's another mistake everyone makes. They conflate advanced civilization or more advanced civilization with being godlike. Don't make that mistake. They're just people like us, but very, very advanced. Now, they may have IQs of 450, so I'm a moron um, by comparison. But... <laughs> which I will admit, I am a moron by comparison with some of these civilizations, but, um, or an imbecile. Um, <laughs> a primate. <laughs> but nevertheless, it doesn't mean that they become infallible. You know, I think infallibility rests with divinity 
and the unbounded being, and that's it. Anything this side of it is subject to failure <laughs> and error, even the archange archangels. So you just keep that in mind as you, as you look at this. There's not infallibility assigned just because it's very, very advanced. Uh, it it kind of reminds me of, everyone know what the cargo cults were of World War II? Great story, because this is a great example of the mistake humans make. So in World War II, we were flying you know, these propeller planes and landing them on islands in the Pacific. And we landed on some islands where there were native peoples who had never seen Western civilization or an airplane. And um, when we left uh, and then came back, we came back and we found that the native peoples had made uh, altars and made things that look like a, a, a biplane with a propeller and they were worshiping because it was gods that had come from the sky and it had become <laughs> it's like the movie the gods must be crazy you know the guy throws a coke bottle out the window and the people start fighting over this so we we need to take a step back and say okay these are a very advanced civilization some of them may be uh, i think are 10 to the seventh years uh, millions of years more developed than we are and all of them are thousands of years. But many of them are hundreds of thousands to millions of years more developed socially, spiritually, technologically than Homo sapiens are. Um, but nevertheless, they're still people. Now, there are people that are very, very advanced. And there are people, some of them are so advanced that they could be mistaken as gods <laughs> in the sort of ancient... Uh, archaeology and, and uh, the ancient astronaut sort of concepts. Uh, and, and of course, this makes total sense. I mean, if you have uh, something that appears like that, that can appear dematerialized, rematerialized, go straight through objects, it would look like something metaphysical and spiritual. And so there, there is the beginning of the conflation of very advanced civilizations and technologies with the mythology that becomes sort of a catechism and misunderstanding. So we need to be careful not to make that mistake. We need to say, oh, okay, childhood's end. Let's understand this uh, and approach these civilizations as really advanced civilizations, but because we are conscious and can become in this state of universal consciousness, in that sense, equal, totally 100% equal, even though we haven't developed all the fine points of functioning yet. I mean, we're more dysfunctional than functional. I think you all agree as, as a species, but you know, we, we can evolve to a higher level of function through conscious development and evolution. And these civilizations understand that. I think, of course, the big concern of the last 75 years has been, we, you know, we start detonating nuclear bombs and hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere and doing things to destroy the biosphere and the oceans, you, you begin to see, as one British intelligence guy told me, it's like we kicked a hornet's nest because a red flag went up over the planet after we started detonating atomic weapons that, wow, these people have kind of gotten off the reservation are an existential threat to themselves and potentially others. So that's a perspective I want to bring for just a minute. In the heart of compassion of the Buddha, as it were, is how might humans be viewed? Okay, in the last hundred years, we've killed around 200 million people in warfare and continue to do so. I lived in the Middle East for three years, saw plenty of stuff. And that doesn't count just murders, good old-fashioned homicides. I mean, organized murder, which is warfare. 200 million, well, that's the population of many of these planets but we've just wiped out in a couple of generations through fighting over what? An economic system, a religious system, a this system, a that system. So, but then you combine that, so it's no longer with swords and maces and even muskets, it's with thermonuclear weapons. <laughs> and in covert programs, these rather fearsome scalar electromagnetic weapons based on these very advanced trans-dimensional sciences. So I think that the, the civilizations are correct to have some deep concern, and I think they need also to have people scattered around the world, everywhere, who understand these issues and will go out calmly, but with a depth of understanding and a depth of experience and attempt to make contact 
that's peaceful and mutually beneficial, which is the whole gist of the CE5 initiative, um, the close encounters of the fifth kind initiative. And a close encounter of fifth kind is simply when humans say, I'm going to make contact as a diplomat and initiate it and allow it to continue, however way it flows. And it may be in this dimension, or it may be trans-dimensional, it may be in thought, it may be in part in this dimension and part in another. And sometimes it all comes together in one night and all those phenomena happen at once. We've been out under the stars where we've had objects that have done electronics, people who've had remote views in their mind where there are 10, 5, 10 people see or hear the same thing, a craft then appears that everyone sees, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Now, because the whole gamish of sort of phenomenon, and then there'll be these beings that are moving around us that aren't physical, but that are shimmering. It's almost like a subtle hologram moving around the desert or moving around the, on the beach or wherever we are. Really amazing stuff. And what I've, what I've found is that people have expectations that are based on, let's go to Starbucks and have you know, a croissant and a latte. No, 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 they, they, there's other ways that they, they communicate. Uh, and, and a lot of it is because that's edifying, it, that's uh, instructive. It opens up another dimension and aspect. And part of it is just practicality. You know, if you're in an op what's called a hostile theater of operations, using military speak, which would be called Earth, that has uh, space-based weapon systems that are all out there already deployed since 1965. I know guys who designed them. That when these objects fully materialize, will target them with an electromagnetic scalar weapon that goes faster than the speed of light. Believe me. They're not going to, it's not the 50s and 60s anymore where they just would materialize and land everywhere. Now, they do sometimes, but it's risky. So we have to operate with that understanding also. So there's another understanding I want to bring to this that people do not like hearing, but, you know, I'm an emergency doctor. You come into my ER with a headache and I find a brain tumor, I'm not going to tell you you got a migraine. I'm going to say you got a brain tumor. So here's the deal. <laughs> We've developed systems that, unfortunately, are approaching parity transdimensionally with what some of these civilizations have in terms of technology, which means that we are a threat. Um, and also means that, now, not that, there are, that the intelligence community can't be everywhere at all places at all times, believe me. Unfortunately, when I'm around doing something like this, in, in all likelihood, it is monitored, but you guys, this is why my whole, whole idea is to squeeze the tube of toothpaste so, and get it out. And then I become redundant, unnecessary. If I drop dead, it doesn't matter. Because you guys can do it, and they cannot keep track of thousands, with tens of thousands of people now who understand or are, trying, or are attempting to do this. So I think that's the power of the people coming together and decentralizing this operation. And by decentralizing it, it's like decentralizing it away from, from me and my, my, the center of my operation. Um, because they cannot keep track of all that. Um, <laughs> so don't, don't make the boogeyman in the intelligence community more powerful than they are. It's a little bit like the Wizard of Oz, you know, the man behind, who's the man behind the curtain, you know, pulling all the levers, scaling the bejeebies out of everyone. Now, I'm not saying they're a total paper tiger, but at the same time, they're not omniscient or omnipresent, which means that you guys can do this and have some amazing... Uh, success with contact uh, separate from me being around. You know, my purpose is just to teach and to let people understand how this happens and then go do it yourself. The medical model is see one, do one, teach one. You see it done once, if you're in med school, you see it done once and then you do it and the next time you're teaching someone to do it. Boom, boom, boom. So that's the model and it works because that's how it propagates. Knowledge propagates very quickly that way. And uh, the, uh, if, if you take that to heart, um, you, you'll find that you begin to learn these abilities in meditation and the, the techniques of the CE5 protocols, go out and do some experiences, and then you have some learning curve, and then you begin to share it with other people. And it just takes off. And we have some great people around all over the world doing this. 
like I said, every continent. Um, so that's, that's what I want to encourage people to do and empower you to do it. The other thing I want to share uh, in this sort of introductory, you know, these first couple hours, is the understanding of the mind and all the different ways that our experience can relate to ET manifestations. Now, there's something called uh, in the Vedic tradition, the Siddhis, S-I-D-D-H-I-S. These are different abilities and powers that people can develop as they develop higher consciousness. Now, these run the gamut of almost everything you've heard about, some of which has been relegated to mythology, but is actually very real, such as levitation, dematerialization, materialization, um, changes in your body density to move through solid objects, precognition, we've talked about, uh, teleportation, uh, telepathy, uh, materialization of objects, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Now, those are all things that actually humans can do. Those are advanced applications of higher states of consciousness. Uh, but understand that there's a scientific correlation to every conscious city. So whatever that you can imagine that any enlightened master has done can be routinized or made routine through a scientific method, even when it, up, up to and including levels of the astral, you may call celestial conscious cos, com, cosmos, and do it scientifically. I always tell people that the uh, <laughs> a really hilarious story of this captain of a Navy contract vessel that was in the South Pacific in 63. Jacques Vallée had the story, but he didn't have the source. It was a third-hand story for him, where we had the, we were testing the, uh, I think they were the, the, the Atlas uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. We were firing them downstream in the South Atlantic, and this captain who contacted me was on a ship that was retrieving them after a test fire. Now, these were not hot. They didn't have uh, you know, nuclear weapons on them. They were trying to get the missile to be accurate. But the missiles kept missing their mark, and they knew there was some kind of a subtle electromagnetic thing happening. And there was always an ET craft around. And they got these on radar. So one night, his radar guy they had a new, I think it was RCA radar system, and it was sweeping around, and it, they picked up a craft. And so the, ca the captain was called, came up, they got it. He called the command center, and they got it on radar. Unfortunately, they then hit it with some kind of electronic weapon or something. And the thing blew up. It kind of, there was an explosion in the sky, and it, went, it fell straight down into the water, this, this UFO. And uh, the next morning, his ship was vectored into the point of impact. Um, and they couldn't find the ship, but there was about a six-foot square pod that ejected, that had four of um, the ET beings in it. And this, this guy was a salt-of-the-earth Navy guy, and he said, well, they were handsome little men. Uh, well, they had, their skin was the color of a Sicilian. I never forget him saying that, Sicilian, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, bronze-colored, um, no hair, no pinna, which is the, the, the pinna is the flap, the monkey ears we have. They just have openings, fine lips, a sort of small nose. And just like the man that contacted me from Skunk Works at Lockheed about the astral projection experience, this person contacted me to find out something that had bugged him. It's been, it, it, it stuck in his mind and bothered him for 40 years. And, he, he, and I said, well, what is it? He says, well, we got him out of this thing, this pod. They were ordered to put him in the ship's freezer. Um, till the a submarine, nuclear submarine came along and took them, and they were all threatened with death if they talked about this. Um, and the, he says these little men were in <laughs> sort of these metallicized uh, fabric. It was almost metal, metal, soft metal like fabric, one piece suits. I said, yeah, like a onesie. But they didn't have any buttons or zippers. And he said, they, how could they have gotten in them? And I've said, this is why you're calling me? <laughs> <laughs> and it was. 
this was exactly why he was calling me. And I said, well, I don't know if you're going to like my answer. And he said, well, tell me. I know those damn things, you could have to cut them off, but we couldn't even cut them. I said, well, the way that they, the suit is made, they just stand into an energy field that has a resonant, and it materializes around them. Like 3D printing, but like a 3D, but zip. So there are no, and it comes off the same way. It dematerializes off and materializes on. But I said, did you notice anything about this um, thing that they were in that, you, that was floating? And he said, yeah, it had no pieces. I said the same thing. So uh, I call this uh, sort of a infra-ultrasonic manufacturing, where if you imagine going beyond the speed of light, speed of electrons, beyond the zero-point energy field, and creating a, sort of an architectural blueprint of a spacecraft that's in that dimension, like an astral, like your astral body, and have that resonate, and it comes into this dimension in toto. So it recruits the atoms, the molecules, the structures, not by digging them up and smelting them and banging them and doing rivets like we do on an airplane, but it, and that's, I call this extraterrestrial manufacturing 101 that I'm sharing with you. So that's why these spacecraft, the guys who I know who've uh, gone to ones that have retrieved them, they're seamless. Now, if you see one that has rivets and seams and parts that are, that's Lockheed and Northrop's and Boeing's anti-gravity stuff. But these, the ET ones, are completely seamless, and the light coming from them is so amazing, it's so pure, you never quite forget it, because the light is coming from a source and materials that aren't manufacturable. You couldn't even manufacture something that pure in space. And there was a part of a craft that they got in Brazil, and I forget it had mag mag magnesium and some other stuff in it, but the, the elements that were in it were so pure that even in the vacuum of space, we could not manufacture it. And no one understood how they could be doing this. I said, because they're not going to some asteroid or planet and digging up stuff out of the earth and smelting it and melting it and then putting it together. They're creating a, a, a field and it resonates and then comes in from that trans-dimensional virtual, ast near astral, I call it, the near astral. And it then pops as a totality into 3D. Make sense? Which, if you study the literature of, of the craft that have been retrieved and even the clothing on these beings, they're consistently this same report. Now, what is, why is that important? Because it means that when you're out under the stars and you see something, and if it seems just, it's too beautiful to be real. It looks like a jewel. We were once in Colorado and there was an object. It looked like it was a, it looked like it was a crystalline jewel in the sky. And it was there for a number of minutes. And you couldn't even, it, it, it was painful. It was so beautiful. And then there was a, a, a fighter jet was vectored in. And the thing popped and began to dry, go off, looked exactly like a 737. Everyone saw it. So, you know, but the, what's, what's fascinating is, is, is the purity of the light and the quality of it. And then there's one more thing. These craft are imbued at the level of nanobiotechnology. You know what that is, nano, uh, where they're actually living and they're conscious. So the craft itself has the consciousness of the occupants, and often it's the, the, the chief pilot or the person who's actually uh, directing it, which is usually, they will either touch it and think and they'll go, all right? But the craft itself is not just like a piece of machinery. It's actually living. And there have been more than one military guy I've interviewed who have been on uh, retrieval missions when they get there, and the craft has uh, been injured. I call it injured because it's, it's, it's organic. And there'll be a crack and it'll be trying to heal. Like if you did a cut and did a time lapse of a healing of a wound on skin, it's doing this kind of thing, trying to fix itself. 
And so the craft themselves are nanobiotechnology at the level where they then can subsume or take on the awareness of the occupants. And that's how they operate. So many times people have an experience with a UFO, but they'll feel that the UFO itself was communicating or was conscious. I say, well, it is. That it was like this living, organic, conscious thing. Uh, and many times people will dismiss it, and I'll go, no, thousands of people have had the same experience. And it's because it is. It is a living, conscious nanobiotechnology at the level that it can then take on the awareness of the occupant or the occupants. But usually it's the main occupant who's the well, anthropocentrically projecting here, captain or the person in charge. The really important thing to know, because if you're out into the stars, I remember last year, just before I had to take this trip to Australia, and I was laying on the beach, and I was uh, with a friend, and it was beautiful. You could see the whole Milky Way galaxy on the outer, it was on the outer banks. Um, and I was out there, and we were talking about this stuff. And there's someone who had never seen one of these objects. And suddenly, in the Milky Way, an object about that big at arm's length, which is huge, it was pretty close and pretty big, materialized, and it was this beautiful kind of crimson, ruby red, but it was, it was like it was living. It was like this thing that was living, and it moved and went the whole distance of the Milky Way galaxy. It wasn't an instantaneous thing. It was there for a little while. I don't know if anyone else on Earth saw it, but we saw it. We were looking straight up. And it was like it was alive. The sky was alive. The object was alive. And I realized it was going right in the direction of Australia, which a few days later, I was wheels up to Australia. So, um, and I, I think it was, I told my wife, I said, I think they were telling me, you know, bon voyage and we'll be with you there. So, so it, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. And it can happen that easily and that quickly, you know, if you open up to it. Um, and ultimately, the, the central science of all of this, yes, there's materials, there's electronics, there's communication modalities, but the central technology and understanding is understanding yourself, your thoughts, your mind, the meditative state, and how that can be used to make contact. And in deep meditation, you can Un, pretty much unfurl, unravel any mystery you wish to. In the Vedic tradition, there's something called Ritambara Pragya, Ritam. And it's a level of consciousness where it's very, very deep. It's just sort of like this side of unbounded samadhi state, where Ritam is located, where if you put your awareness, you can ask and kind of intend to know anything. Now, of course, I guess the, the supreme being knows all things at all times, but an individual can know this, ob this thing, that thing, this object, you know, one at a time, or maybe if you're really brilliant, a hundred things at a time, or a million, but not everything. Um, but I think that's the wellspring of intu intuition, and that resides within every single person. So it's like this uh, conscious quantum hologram where all of us are part of this conscious hologram, and every single one of us even though unique, at the deep level of consciousness, we're plugged into that unbounded. And if we travel to that, that's where we become one. And if we begin to experience that deeply enough, we can begin to experience that even while we're walking around, driving down the road. In my experience in the ER, I, I mean, I used to have a lot of experiences where it would just be this intuitive flash and I would know someone had a brain tumor or I would know someone had something completely hidden with no symptomatology. And I would act on it. And the nurses call me a warlock, um, but <laughs> they were awesome. In North Carolina, I said, well, these hillbilly nurses were great, but they, <laughs> but they would say, Dr. Greer's a warlock. And, um, <laughs> and so we would have these experiences. Uh, at one time, a man came in, and I, this is why I encourage people to do this. I don't care if you're an airline pilot, a uh, software engineer, a business executive, a uh, bus driver, 
a doctor, whatever you are, if you learn these principles of consciousness and the cities that go with it, these abilities, it will be very valuable in your life. And um, there was this man that came in and he was a 26 year old guy with a couple kids and he had the flu, it seemed like the flu, it was flu season. And then I looked at him and um, I looked and I thought, God, he's got a big brain tumor. And he didn't have any symptoms of a neurological insult at all. And I turned to the nurse and um, she was fat bubbles, love bubbles. She walked like this and have a bouffant. Um, and I turned to bubbles, I said, I need a stat cat scan of the brain. And she said, well, doctor, she's only got the flu. <laughs> I said, just do it. I mean, it was always in my mantra, just do it. I thank God I didn't have to go through a bureaucracy, insurance company, or government. And I just, they did just do it. So he did it, and the radiologist calls back an emergency call back. And radiologists usually don't, you know, they don't bother. Well, this guy's got a astrocytoma that's like a pancake over his brain, and it's herniating his brain stem. Well, the, the brain stem going down through the frame and magnum gave him the fever, the chills, the no all his symptoms. But there were no focal neurological symptoms. And so he went to emergency neurosurgery. He lived. Uh, I just see him periodically. He'd come in occasionally. And, but, it, but it was totally, I'd say, almost anyone who would have, in fact, the neurosurgeon said, how did you even think to get a CAT scan? Because it just seemed like he had the flu. I said, well, I just had a hunch. I couldn't say to him that I actually remote viewed and sensed that there was this thing. But it's like, you know, how golden retrievers have been trained to find mel melanomas and stuff. It's like humans, we have this ability, whether you're a scientist or a doctor or a pilot or whatever you are, and we, we've shut ourselves off from our birthright of being conscious, enlightened beings. And I'll, I'll, it's so easy to get back to that. You sit quietly, do nothing, do a meditative process, and confirm that you can do these things. And it will, it'll just unfold. And it's not like every single day is like that, but it happens enough that you know, life becomes wonderful, magical. And I would really encourage people to do that. And when you're doing this contact work with ETs, it means that you can do this under the stars with three or four or five people that you're close to. Remember what Dr. John found at Princeton. If someone is in a state of, of unified awareness and are bonded and they are intending with thought, it has an exponentially greater effect than one person by themselves. And so that's the power of a group of people doing this, so long as they're harmonious and not fighting like a bunch of wildcats. Um, uh, and there's coherence in the group. So if you can create coherence in a group, it's incredibly powerful, because it's orders of magnitude. It's an exponential increase in the power of the thought, the consciousness, and the effect to make contact. And uh, Somehow, some way, these civilizations will respond. So when you were talking about the suppression of this knowledge, um, I guess my question uh, to you is, do you subscribe to any kind of idea like Illuminati, um, you know, curtailing this? And um, does any type of negative kind of ET presence fit into that model? where it's kind of been keeping it like a prison planet type of idea. Well, the question is, is um, in terms of the information being kept secret, is there some um, Illuminati type entity or perhaps even ET presence keeping it secret? Uh, I doubt it in the way that it's the mythology, the internet mythology would say it is. Um, I think it has more to do with the fact that there are, let's say call cartels interest groups that are also competing interest groups, human, not ET, that don't want certain aspects of this out. And there are points where they cooperate and there are points where they don't. Um, now there's something, the, the latest iteration of it, I've been told from my, some of my intelligence sources, is called SIG, S-I-G, which is the Senior Interagency uh, Intelligence Group. And the SIG, um, which, you know, from the old majesty and majestic entity from the Truman era, uh, and um, some of the documents I have, it says magic, M-A-J-I-C, um, classification. Uh, 
those are you know intelligence groups that operate out of normal chain of command. Um, they work with people in different countries. Uh, and then they will usually have representation from different interest groups, such as religious, technological, financial, um, macroeconomic, et cetera, and so on. Um, and so there's not a, there's a, a really a simplistic view that there's sort of like one group. It's the Bilderbergers, it's the Illuminati, it's the this. I said. It was interesting because I, a few years ago I was at a meeting in San Francisco and it was after the Disclosure Project were launched. And Henry Dakin, who at the Dakin Toy Company was hosting a, a sort of a reception at his loft in, um, in San Francisco. And um, Judith Scutch was there, who was the original publisher of the Course in Miracles with Marianne Will, and very big supporter, and her husband was a colonel. And she was friends with this man who had just been up at the Bohemian Grove, with the whole Bohemian Grove, like 2,500 people. And this issue came up. And the issue of, uh, it, it was a very wealthy European financier. Um, and so this issue came up about uh, disclosure because they'd all been in the news. And they had someone there to get up on the stage and tell everyone that they were part of a high, very high governmental scientific entity that had looked into this, that none of it was true, that it was all just misinterpretations and you know, swamp gas and Venus rising or whatever, the usual blather, and all those 2,500 people took it to heart and believed it because it was their peerage. So I want to talk about peer-to-peer -peer, um, containment systems. So you have one group of peerage it's called the U.S. Senate. Out of those 100 guys, one or two people are read into or, or know about this subject. Their task is to lie to the other 99 or 98. Bilderbergers, there might be a handful of them. They lie to the rest. Bohemian Grove, same thing. So people have this very simplistic view of how secrecy like this would be maintained and that there's some sort of vast sort of conspiracy and there'd be all these people. Um, because of compartmentalization, there would be people, and compartmentalization is where you have uh, you know, a very walled off area of operation where it's compartmented to that particular task or research. And it is so narrowly focused and the people in there have such blind, they don't know what the person in the next cubicle is doing, never mind what the big picture is. So it's very easy when you have extreme compartmentalization to keep most people in the dark about what's really going on. And then there'll be a handful of people who really know. And they may, you know, this committee, if you want to look at it that way, uh, this intelligence group might have two or 300 people from different countries who are themselves members of different elite groups. And those folks would then lie to their brethren in that peerage to deceive them. And that's their job. And they're trained professionally to lie. Um, so it isn't as if it, so most, I would say 99.99999% of everything I've ever seen that's out there on this trash dump called the internet uh, isn't, has any, has almost no bearing in reality. Um, because it's just too imbecilic. It would not be operating that way. Now, for special compartment, you know, top secret, TSSCI, top secret special compartment intelligence to operate is the compartment part. It's not the top secret part. There are 980,000 people in the United States with top secret clearances, which means they're common as dirt. Um, it's the compartment you're in, all right? So you may have Q clearance. It used to be the you know, clearance for nuclear weapons and stuff. But it doesn't mean that just because you have Q clearance, you have clearance into um, electromagnetic gravitics. In fact, you almost certainly would not. So, and the same thing goes in for, for corporate. Uh, same thing goes for, I, it, it was interesting, I was at the, in San Francisco 
uh, at another time, and there was a woman who lived in Pacific Heights, the end of Broadway, where all the $100 million mansions, you know, the Getty home and Larry Ellison, all these people live. And she was hosting her neighbors for a salon. And I was the guest for this dinner party. And, you know, I mean, there were all these people. And the guy on one side of me had been the chairman of SRI, Stanford Research International. And they had had contracts dealing with this issue. But he said, I was only the chairman of SRI, so I didn't have a need to know what was really going on. So because my, I've never been in the government, but I have all these hundreds of people who provided information from all these different walks of life over the last 50 years in terms of experience, people going all the way back to the 50s, 60 years, that sort of, I've sort of become a, sort of a source for that. So he was at, picking my brain. He was the chairman of SRI. And then uh, across the table was the chairman of AT&T. Now, AT&T has had a lot of contracts with the intelligence community dealing with this issue. But the chairman of AT&T didn't know about it because he was only the chairman of AT&T. He was not read into. Uh, so it, it's compartmented at corporate, governmental, political, and religious levels. Um, and uh, it, it's not so simple that you, there would be some one entity you can name and then, you know, sort of vent your spleen, that group. Is, now, the question of whether there are interstellar civilizations that are cooperating or facilitating that, I'm very skeptical of. But it could be theoretically possible that in the early days, they were hoping that there would be some kind of a, a rapprochement with uh, leaders, military or political, and have had, had had contact. An ongoing level of that is less likely, but if it is, if it is happening, then we need a CE5 effort even more. Here's what I always say to people. Let's say that there are, they say now, 11 billion star systems in the Milky Way that have um, Earth-like planets around them. And the Milky Way is only one of billions of galaxies. The likelihood is that there are countless numbers of civilizations out there. And you can't prove a negative. I can't say everyone is at a, a state of enlightenment. I will say that if they become interstellar and they haven't blown themselves up yet, they're more evolved than we are. Um, however, it could be that there are some that have interests and ethical concerns that don't comport with contemporary human ones. But that's where you would need to have even more of a diplomatic communicative effort. And the worst thing you can do is relegate that to people in covert military operations because they're only looking at the universe with rose-colored military glasses on. And it's all about power and control. And so, uh, you know, it's sort of like <laughs> when uh, there used to be a, a U.S. senator from Virginia uh, named John Warner, not the current Mark Warner, no relation. And he had been chairman of armed services and, and intel, various things. And uh, I knew he was involved with uh, majestic majesty and, and, and magic. Um, and he had been uh, one of the secretaries of the Navy way back, I believe, or undersecretary of the Navy. And um, one of his, uh, a member of my team who had dated him for a while, uh, went out at his place in Virginia and met with him and brought this whole issue up. And he basically listened to her and said nothing, stone-faced. And where she left off the previous conversation to that exact word, he picked it up and continued. And just that issue was just sequestered out. He would not acknowledge it at all. And my, my, one of my military advisors had the same experience with Admiral Harry Train, who did the exact same thing uh, when it was brought up, though, except he also said, he said, I am profoundly disinterested in discussing this issue with you, and dropped it. Okay, and that was the same Admiral who was at Atlantic Command when we went to full code zebra because of these craft off the coast of the eastern coast. Uh, of the United States. Um, so I think that, you know, they're, they're very, very disciplined about that. 
Um, and I've met with a number of these sort of characters. And, um, and yet you have other people like Senator Claiborne Pell, who the Pell Grants, anyone who was really poor like I was who got a Pell Grant to go to college. <laughs> um, uh, I was at a dinner party with him. In fact, my wife and I were, were, were there and, um, for Noetic Sciences Institute. And uh, um, after the dinner party, we went out on, on the patio of this beautiful home in San Rafael near uh, George Lucas's place, right next to the Skywalker Ranch. And, and we were there, and, and Senator Pell and I were talking, and he just sort of epitomized noblesse oblige and was this wonderful guy, very, very genuine, crossed the aisle, tried to do great things for the country, um, patrician, very great. And we were talking, and, uh, you know, and he turned to me. He says, well, Dr. Greer, would you come and, and brief my staff on this? Uh, and I said, well, sure, any time you want me to. I, he says, because we've asked about this, and no one's ever told us anything. And he'd been on every committee. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was looking at him, and I looked up at the stars, and I looked at him, and I said, you know, you've been deprived of dealing with the ultimate foreign relations issue, and you're the chairman of the Foreign Relations <laughs> Committee. And I pointed to the stars above my head, and he looked at me through those you know, horn rim glasses and blinked, and he says, well, Dr. Greer, I'm afraid you might be right. I said, well, I am. <laughs> and it was really a poignant, but really in a funny but sad moment. That here's this guy, you know, had been in Congress or the Senate since the 50s, then been denied any information on this, who would have been a great interstellar diplomat. And instead, the wise, the enlightened, um, the peace-loving people who should have been handling this got shoved to the side, relegated to the scrap heap of history. And the warmongers and the control freaks and the misanthropic money whores, uh, I have a few other adjectives I'll leave off, uh, kind of took it over, which is what happened. As Eisenhower famously said, beware the military industrial complex. He was specifically talking about the fact he lost control over this and other issues in 1956 when uh, Nelson Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Commission, Lawrence's brother, Nelson Rockefeller reorganized the Department of Defense and CIA under the Rockefeller Commission in 1956. So no president since 1956 has, has had, even if they've known about the issue, they have not had operational control over these projects. So it's been an unconstitutional, out, off the rails for the last almost 60 years. I know that Maharishi University in Fairfield, Iowa and the David Lynch Foundation put a lot into promoting TM with students and veterans and all kinds of global walks. Might they be interested in the CE5 protocols, do you think? Oh yeah, a lot of people in the meditation movements, TM and otherwise, are. And in fact, I've been invited out there. Um, I have, I've never had the time to go. But a lot of people who do meditation and study the physics behind mind-body and also the science of consciousness fields are very interested in this. Um, so. Um, what, if anything, they have done with it or would want to do with it, I don't know. Maybe a bridge too far because, you know, there's, a, there's sort of a, a nexus of disinformation and auto, automatic kook factor that gets associated with anything UFO and ET. And that's been done since the 1950s by the CIA, and it's been very effective. So a lot of people don't want to lose their respectability by touching the UFO issue. <clears throat> That's just true. I mean, it's a psychological warfare is the term used in the CIA document I have from 1953, uh, where they specifically talked about the psychological warfare value of the subject, but also how it could be basically neutralized. And um, even up to the point of, of enlisting a very renowned scientist uh, on the payroll of the agency, a doctor... Donald Menzel, who was this renowned uh, astrophysicist at uh, Harvard, 
Um, I have a document where it names him and it says it cannot be known that he's working with us on this because then it would lose all credibility. But he was the person who back in that era of 56 would stand up and debunk all this. And then there was a Professor Condon of the Condon Committee at the University of Colorado that was in charge of the Project Blue Book, uh, the Condon Commission to look into whether Project Blue Book at the Air Force should be continued or shut down. And so he was the chairman of the, of the, of the committee. It was called the Condon Committee, C-O-N-D-O-N. And Professor Condon worked with Dr. Robert Woods, who I mentioned is one of our disclosure witnesses from uh, McDonnell Douglas. And when Dr. Woods kept bringing really hard data cases, he, uh, Dr. Condon went to the head of McDonnell Douglas, old man McDonnell himself, and tried to get Dr. Woods fired. I have all this on videotape, by the way. And eventually, you know, and, and of course, Dr. Woods was just so shocked that this man who was supposed to be an independent professor looking into this was so biased. After I met with the CIA director in the 90s, I got a tranche of documents that named Dr. Condon as an asset of the CIA. And it's just in black and white. So it's very, very well done from the point of if you want to be Machiavellian and just twisted. But it is well done, and for the right amount of money or threats or inducements, uh, they can get the cooperation of certain people who have sterling reputations and who can then ridicule or take the subject down. Uh, so the problem usually is, is that by the time I emerged on the scene in the 90s, the CIA already had a 40-year run on top of me of disinformation uh, ridiculing the subject, being sure that things were covered in the National Enquirer, catapulting to the forefront of the field charlatans and cranks and all kinds of misinformation and disinformation and lunatic conspiracy theories. And so the problem is, you're, you know, it's not like you're, 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 you're climbing Mount Everest not from base camp, but from 20,000 leagues under the sea up to the top of Mount Everest. And that's the problem with a lot of people who privately will express a great deal of interest and publicly would not want to be associated because of the social opprobrium and ridicule attached to the subject. Um, I was just curious, is there a particular ET civilization that's kind of identified themselves to your contact group? Um, I was thinking in terms of like the Phoenix Lights, I know from my understanding is that they have attributed that to the uh, Yael civilization. So I was just curious if there was a particular civilization that's kind of communicated or identified themselves. She's asking if there's a particular ET civilization that's identified itself to our group. The answer is uh, not one particular, but a number, and a number of different species. And my under our purpose of our group is interstellar diplomacy and bringing all of them together. See, so what we would want to avoid is um, a bilateral, a unilateral, but a bilateral or bipolar cosmos, and you want it to be multilateral, and you want it to be uh, all civilizations, if they're capable of reaching this planet and in fact are here, or near it, or in our solar system, or have that capability, we would want to have humans who are on a team, who are interested in dialogue, peace, and what I call universal peace. I mean, world peace is, is like, the Treaty of, you know, the League of Nations is, is way too late for just world peace. Um, we have to go, unfortunately, straight to universal peace. Because it doesn't do any good if you have world peace, but the world is united against fighting one or more ET civilizations. That's not going forward. That's going to oblivion. So Hollywood notwithstanding, and the latest Tom Cruise movie notwithstanding, you, you really cannot... Uh, enter this subject if you're serious about uh, having a future at all without having a multilateral approach. And so we have had very specific contact experience with different types of species and uh, what have you. And, but my view is that over the years, it's many different ones, different appearances, heights, shapes, the whole bit, even in some of the photographs we have. But the, 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 the point I make to people is that doesn't really matter. That's the external appearance. It's the fact that they're all conscious, sentient, and that what we want to move to is a time of, of universal peace uh, that involves all these civilizations. 
uh, because you know you cannot go into if we're going to leave the sort of the last era behind the era of division and fighting and warfare which has been the primary organizing principle of this planet for the last few thousand years both financially and institutionally has been war it still is it's still the biggest industry you know it's trillions um, if you're going to move past that and certainly if you're going to move into space you have to move into it with a new consciousness as einstein said no problems ever been solved by the consciousness that created it and so the consciousness of us versus them and picking and choosing and this and that so from the very beginning what i found is that we were having experiences with very different types of civilizations and species all shapes sizes everything and it's really beautiful and i think that's how that's by design the, the, the philosophy or the ethical underpinning of what we're doing is based on doing exactly that. So. Yes, sir. I'm curious, as I, I pay close attention to the website and pay attention to the money raised for the project related to energy development. Right. And I've noticed it sort of remained at 241K for a while. That's right. It's pretty much after the release, it kind of just stayed there. So, um, with, I mean, you talk a lot, a lot about some very high-level connections, both um, in the military and wealth-wise as well. And I'm just curious as to what is the real obstacle from utilizing those to get to. I mean, we're talking about free energy. $6 million is really not that much money. I agree with you. Yeah, he's asking the question with the numbers of people who have been interested and looked into these, these issues, why hasn't the amount been raised to create this sort of initial to your lab research project. And, um, you know, you have to ask those people. I know them. Uh, I can tell you what they've told me. The people who are associated with governments and contracting, they don't want to touch it because they're afraid. Um, there are some high net worth people I've approached. Um, and I'll just give you one example. I can give you this example. You know, my wife knew the de gory details of this, and so did my whole group. Um, and this is somebody who lived in Virginia, not far from me, but whose family were industrialists. And they're, they had about a $750 million a year income. And, you know, five private jets. And actually, I'd used them some, some of these planes to go to some sensitive meetings. And so I approached the sort of the scion, the, 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 the elder of this family, really controlled the operation. And I explain to him how we're running out of time to get this dealt with and would he do this and help? Because basically the amount of money he blows out of the tail of his Gulfstream jet would do it. And uh, he said, well, I'll tell you why. It's too dangerous and I'm not gonna risk my children and grandchildren who fly around on my planes to do this. I said, well, if I'm doing it, why are you at risk? And he told me a very interesting story that back in the, like the late 1960s, he knew an executive with General Motors who was telling him about the um, zero point type energy systems they had in some of the classified research at General Motors and that he felt it was time for that to come out so that every car coming off the assembly line was basically an electric free energy car. It didn't have to be plugged in. I mean, way past the Tesla. And this is, I think, in 68. Um, and he said that two weeks later, after he had, was openly talking about this, this executive was found dead. Um, and it looked like a suicide. But this industrialist that I knew very well told me that everyone knew it was not a suicide. And so I found that, you know, pe the fear is the mind killer. So, you know, there are a lot of people who... Um, who know about this, but they don't want to stick their necks out. Um, the public, by and large, just wants to be entertained by it. You know, I would say that if, you know, you can launch an app of, you know, kitty cats playing pianos and probably pull in $10 million in a month or something. You know, what is it, Candy Crush or, you know, some of these idiotic apps and, and video games. Um, but I have not found that the public, the public is always, no offense, doing what you're doing. And that is, why doesn't someone else fund this? So it's a little like, like the little red hen phenomenon, where you know, the little red hen cook, you know, 
everyone wants to eat the cake or bread, but no one wants to help cook it. And so everyone's looking for someone else to do it. Um, it it's, it's like someone being stabbed on the street of New York and everyone watching, and no one wants to intervene. Because the people who are high enough in, in industry and finance know that you're stepping on some big toes if you move into this. And the masses, for the most part, mainly want to be entertained by this subject. It's just sort of a fascinating conspiracy theory sort of thing. And so, but, you know, and so that's been the problem. The, the masses haven't put in the funds as, as sort of a, the, the movie was crowdfunded, but you know, moving that from a few hundred thousand to a few million didn't happen. And then the very wealthy people, for the most part, are really afraid of touching this third rail. Boom, zap. Um, but, you know, if you know someone who's got the courage, it's all about courage. And whether it's going out and making contact or, maybe, you know, having the courage to explore your own capabilities and consciousness or doing this, it's all about the courage we manifest. And um, a lot of times you find that people who are quite wealthy and comfortable do not want to step into something where they could be greatly in harm's way. Um, and so uh, that fear can, it creates its own containment. Now, my own view of it is that I think it's an unfounded fear. I'm not saying there's zero risk. I just think that it's mostly psychological at this point. Um, and um, besides, I tell people I'm the canary in the mine shaft. So as long as I'm still twittering away, you shouldn't have too much to worry about. But, um, you know, I, there have been a number of people, I mean, a few dozen, when I say a few dozen people who have net worth north of hundreds of millions to billions that I've met with, but they do not want to step into this. Um, and what would be easier is to find probably <laughs> 10 or 12 people of more moderate worth who would each put in 500,000 or something. Um, but that hasn't happened either. So we'll see. I mean, I, all, all I say is that, you know, when, the, when people, when, when there's a critical mass of awareness and I keep doing everything I can as a single individual, uh, then it'll happen. And if not, then it won't happen and we'll get the consequences of that. And then it'll happen in the aftermath. It's the phoenix, I call it the phoenix, <laughs> picking all up from the ashes. Uh, so it's not a, it, there's no question in my mind it will happen at some point, but will it be soon enough? And can we avoid a lot of huge problems? I mean. Imagine if we had not needed Mideast oil 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, where we would not have had the hegemony and the presence in the Middle East that have led to the mess we're in now. Um, never mind the biosphere being damaged and the pollution and cancer rates skyrocketing. And, but, you know, again, there was a fear of taking on the macroeconomic status quo. And the macroeconomic status quo, I mean, it's like what, when uh, the Minister of Defense of Canada, Paul Hellyer, and I were talking about this. I, I was at his home, and he says that he was a macroeconomic person to start with. And he said, basically, that's the big problem, is that this is not something that's just like creating another computer system. Or it, it's, it's bringing out a whole paradigm of science, technology, that would change the entire petrodollar system and the whole macroeconomic order, and with it, the commodities markets and, and hundreds of trillions of dollars of wealth that somebody owns that's sitting in the ground in the form of uh, uranium and oil and coal and what have you, plus all the generating capacity that goes with it. So it, it's such a huge change that most people don't want to entertain it, doing it. Um, and I've, you know, I've talked to people at Goldman Sachs about this, and they said, oh yeah, you're talking about basically wiping out $600 trillion in assets. So, trillion. So, you know, and the whole U.S. federal government, including Social Security and all the entitlements, is three and a half trillion. So this is, it's, it, the longer we put it off, the more the world is dependent on the old paradigm and the more it cannibalizes and destroys itself. However, and it becomes more and more difficult to do it. So it's kind of like uh, putting off repairing a, a leak in your roof of your house. You can put it off 
and eventually the damn thing's going to cave in on your head. But all I can do, you know, I don't have the resources to do it, and um, is articulate what could be done, hope there are some people who gather around the vision and, and, and we get it done in enough time. You, know? you have to understand, when I started this in my, I guess I was in my mid-30s and 1990 when I started all this, and my, I thought, well, if I put the information together and provided it on a silver platter tied up in a bow to the right people, they do the right thing. Wrong. So I got disabused of that notion very quickly. Uh, but, you know, so ultimately that's why we then said, well, disclosure of this information, the contact effort, I, I never viewed the government doing that initially. I always saw that as a citizen's diplomacy. Uh, but then also the technology, I realized, would have to be coming from we the people. So it's about organizing we the people. And so I tell everyone who's listening to this, share this information with the right people in your network, send them to our site, and through networking, maybe the right folks will line up who have the courage to step forward and make it a reality. Um, or somebody with one of these technologies who has one that's already operational will step forward and be willing to do something strategically sane. Because the strategically insane thing to do is to do what Stan Meyer did and Rossi is doing and almost every other inventor I know had done which resulted in a catastrophe. So um, all I can do is encourage and, and you know but I do think you know it's all networking you know it's like networking it out there the way that I've you know we've reached the people we've reached is through networking. So that's really a key thing to do. Hey, Dr. Greer. It's tough to be here. Good. Glad um, to be here. So in 2012, there was said to be, you know, a shift in the way we think. And for me, that was the case. Like, consciousness, the word consciousness was in my head just constantly. And that led me down the path to find your work. So I was just wondering if you've noticed any increase in this kind of interest in UFOs, or if you think it's just the grand scheme of the universe. Like, your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know about 2012 per se, but it, it has, in the last couple years, gone up exponentially. Every, all the interest in this. Uh, I mean, to the point that you even have Lockheed Martin putting out information that by 2020 something they're going to have a fusion generator that will run everything. That was in the past month. So what, what you, you, things are moving along, and it, it has been a big move up. Uh, what I'm concerned about, it, it's sort of like the, you know, the Hopi prophecy where there's one timeline that terminates and there's one that continues on. And we're, we're, we have to choose what timeline we want to be on. It, it's called the um, prophecy rock or whatever. It's this etching that the Hopis have. Have you seen it? It's really cool. Um, or, or disturbing, depending on how you look at it. But, um, but uh, and I'm reminded also, you know, Colin Andrews is a very, very good friend of mine, a crop circle guy, of a crop circle that appeared some years ago that had, it was, where it's, it was how all the planets would be in the year 2036, but Earth was not in its orbit. Earth was missing. It, w it was sort of like a warning. Now, this is 2014. Now, that crop circle appeared in like, I don't know, late 90s or early 2000s. But, um, and I don't mean to be apocalyptic in what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, um, as the wonderful Chinese expression goes, unless we change directions, we're likely to end up where we're going. <laughs> where are we going? Where are we headed here? So um, I think that's one of the really uh, you know, important things to realize, and it can happen very, very quickly. This kind of, it's like in physics, and they talk about this um, with quantum uh, systems, is that you get to a certain uh, critical mass of coherence, like in uh, superfluidity and hel helium. And like when 1% of those molecules or atoms uh, of helium are aligned and become coherent, instantly all of them do. And it, bec it becomes what's called superfluidity. And so you have this phase transition, it's called, in physics. And so that can happen also with people. And uh, as Rupert Sheldrake pointed out, um, you know, in, in the whole concept of morphogenic uh, fields. Uh, or it's sort of like the hundredth monkey effect, where a certain population learns something, and then when it reaches that critical mass, suddenly 
uh, monkeys on other islands and in other areas that had no linear contact start automatically know how to do it also. So there's this non-locality of learning in large social systems. And they've proven this with monkeys and primates and also with humans. So all I can say is that if all of us do what we should be doing, we'll hopefully reach that phase transition and move over to this other way of functioning. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, but it does seem to be increasing. And so uh, Rupert Sheldrake uh, did some really great, uh, he's a biologist at Oxford, I believe, uh, who did some wonderful um, work on this in terms of morphogenic fields and uh, what's more popularly called the hunter's monkey effect. Uh, and uh, it, it's a real phenomenon. And, and so we have, to, we have to view it in a very, po that's why I tell people, like people going out, doing meditation together, making contact, putting even the thought or the intent, doesn't matter what you see, just intending to do the correct thing recruits people you'll never know and meet. It has an effect beyond what we can measure um, and, uh, and see. And so, you know, it's more important to do to be in the moment and be in the intent and the process with a pure heart than to be worrying about the outcome. Not that you don't want to worry about the outcome. You want to see a good future. But if you stay in that process, it'll create the good future. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, you talked a year or two ago about representatives from a G8 country um, participating in a um, C5. Yeah. Has there been any development with that? Yeah, so he's asking about uh, one of the G8 countries uh, who um, very supportive of the CE5 initiative. And uh, since it's been a couple of years, I'll talk about it very directly. Um, the country is France. And um, so there was a president a couple of years ago named Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, and Sarkozy's uh, people, who, the, his intelligence and Air Force people who briefed him on all this stuff were very, very interested in what we were doing. And one of the very old families in France um, that actually organized the beheading of Marie Antoinette, um, true, uh, had this old estate uh, in uh, Brittany and uh, invited us there. So what we did a couple years ago, under the ruse of a training, just a, a, a weekend training, is that nobody who came knew this, except a couple of people. Well, of course, my wife knew. She knows everything. Um, <laughs> we had this thing, and of course I knew that it was going to, it, we used this 2,200 acre estate. And there were, there was an admiral there who was very high up. Um, and also he, this admiral has a PhD in uh, physics. Uh, and is also like myself an MD. Very, very, very wonderful man. And a couple other people. And the host family, who of course was a very old, uh, you know, French Foreign Legion, diplomats, a family of very, very old French. Um, and so we did this. This is sort of a training, but so also so that the, the, uh, the, the friendly people in the French government could learn the protocols and see. And so they were there. And then I heard back afterwards that uh, they had the whole area, not cordoned off, but there was a security, uh, observational security perimeter around it. And they tracked uh, craft coming over the at 200,000 kilometers an hour during the CE5. And it was just a group of novices. Most of them had never been out. Um, and we had some amazing experience, including if you've seen the photo, uh, we were setting up one evening and I, everyone on the side of the, the part of the circle where I was sitting, we saw this, I was just setting up to do this uh, Sanskrit Vedic puja. And there was this like this, like a rainbow light that came in just in an instant. And so I had someone take a photograph and there's this sort of royal purple mauve colored fuzzy disc hovering right above the field. It's in this photograph, stunningly gorgeous. Not quite in this dimension, but not out of it either. On the, in the, but everyone looking at that direction saw this thing flash in. And, um, and then we were sitting there one night and this object came over and then 
we had all the cars. There were like 30 cars in this field because we had like 60 people at this thing. And they all started turning their lights on and off. So this thing went over the vehicle zone. And it was like, this is like something out of a Close Encounters of the Third Kind movie. And of course, you know, the Admiral's going, holy shit, you know. <laughs> and, you know, and we're in deep meditation and all of a sudden we hear this, it right next to where, the, beyond where the cars were, this, it was almost like a metallic thing brushing up again. And there was a craft that was quasi-materialized in the corner of the field. And uh, later I went out and there were these little beings, there were about five of them. And you could hear, now the problem is everyone got up and it scared the hell out of them. So you heard this, them scampering off. And so they scampered off and then dematerialized in thin air. Sort of like that one that was in the crop circle a couple years ago where they saw the feet and the police saw this tall, luminous white being that was fully materialized, and the police got out and chased it, and the footprint, and it just disappeared into the field in thin air. You know that case? Oh, well, I was right there when that happened. Yeah, it's near Silbury Hill. Anyway, these expeditions are awesome. You want to come on them, you should come. But, but the point is, is that, so they were very, very interested. Now, from there, in terms of bureaucracy, they're, like in any government, there are people who are part of this magic or majesty group majestic has different acronyms now it's called sig senior interagency group intelligence group they some were friendly some were not friendly um and when you're talking about a government moving off the dime on this openly it's very difficult but it's a again it's an iterative learning process and so uh, the way i view it is that you know see one do one teach one you, you, you demonstrate it, and then hopefully, and I know that they're learning, and probably they're practicing it. Uh, now, the, the ethical construct and the philosophical underpinning of it is that it has to be done within the context of universal peace. It cannot be done within the context of one national entity vaulting itself over another, et cetera. Um, but I know that you know this is not going to be able to be done through the UN because we tried that, you know, back when. Um, Boutros Boutros Ghali was UN Secretary General, and I, you know, I, they were very interested. And his wife came to one of the salons I held in New York, and then um, the um, Secretary General after him, Kofi Annan, um, when we did disclosure project, originally they had committed to hold the disclosure project event at, at the Secretariat uh, of the United Nations. But some folks came in with an all-access pass and essentially threatened to pull funding out of the UN on behalf of a certain number of countries and it would destroy the UN. And I was told, I was called directly by an ambassador who was attached to the UN Secretary General saying, we wish you well, we support what you're doing, but we cannot do it at the UN. And that's why it was held here at the National Press Club. I have not told that story much. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, you look over the last 10, 15 years, there have been a lot of initiatives from the starts and stops from various governments. And so, yeah, there's a lot of interest, um, but it, it's sort of like, you know, that old saying, everyone wants to be first to be second. No, every, you know, there's a hesitancy to stick your neck out too far on something very controversial, as I mentioned earlier, but also on something that has um, not, not just a social opprobrium, but where there's some very powerful people who are, are not afraid of using their power in retribution against uh, an entity that would do it. And this is why I tell people the best, you know, to me, the clearest path forward for contact, disclosure, and bringing these technologies out are the people, masses of people doing it. Uh, large corporations, the very rich, governments. Um, you don't want to be prejudicial against them, which is why I'm like last year, I was happy to go to Australia and meet with all these folks. Um, but you don't expect, you don't, you, you have limited expectations. You hope they do the right thing. But what I learned starting back in the Clinton years is that everyone wants to know about this stuff very few people want to do anything about it. So knowing about it and doing something about it are two totally separate things. 
Uh, and all we can do, and I think all of each of us can do, is to provide the information, the knowledge, the vision, and let that gather uh, amongst the populace and also with world leaders and other people and see where it goes. Um, and I, I have a very, not detached, but a very realistic philosophy about that. Um, and you know, many people have said, well, you know, when is disclosure gonna happen? I said, well, we did it already. And people think I'm joking. I said, no, when we started this, only about a quarter or a third of the people thought this was real. Now it's 50 some percent. Last year, the Marist poll said that 43% of, you know, of Americans think that we're currently being visited by interstellar extraterrestrial beings. It's a huge number. So I said, in terms of the public, it's kind of there. In terms of officialdom, and what I call the hidebound inborn elite, the, the sort of inbred elite of the world, uh, there's, you know, that's a, a harder thing to get through. Uh, and no smart part because of both power politics, but also more easily. As, as, as this one Air Force uh, witness told me, he says, the real way this has been kept secret is just sheer ridicule. The subject, you know, you really don't have to do or say anything. It hides itself because people don't want to be laughed at. People don't want to be put down by their peers. People don't want to be, uh, lose esteem amongst their colleagues and what have you. So talk about courage, the biggest courage it takes for someone who's interested in this is to speak the truth in a way that is appropriate. Um, you can't bring everything out to someone who doesn't know anything about it, but that's why we put Disclosure Project, the book, and the videos together so that anyone who's even at the le level of the most basic linear understanding will say, boy, where there's smoke, there's fire, because here's a lot of Here's a lot of information um, from people who with sterling credentials. And, you know, and there is this sort of strange hypocrisy um, with uh, the mainstream media. And that is, if you had three people who would go on record with the New York Times or Washington Post about a senior person at the White House having sex with someone, it'd be all over. I have 110 people on videotape and testimony with corroborating documents, with their DD-214s, which is their discharge papers from the military, with st signed statements, witness oaths that they would testify under oath before Congress with the penalties of perjury, federal penalties of perjury, and it gets ignored by all the mainstream media. And you talk about a double standard. So this is, of course, what we're up against um, because the, the big mainstream media Again, not so much, now some of them are tied into, quote, the cabal, if you want to call it that, that keeps it secret, but most of them, it's like this, uh, I have a family member who will remain nameless, who used to be the city editor of the Boston Globe. And when she found out I was getting involved with this stuff, she says, I don't care if you put a dead extraterrestrial body on my desk, we're not gonna run this story, we're a blue chip paper, that belongs in the National Enquirer, and it would never appear in the Boston, I mean, it was just like that. This is a family member. So, and, and this was not, I assure you, it's not someone on the payroll of the CIA, like Donald Menzel was or, or Professor Condon. So I think that we have to understand that it is a real educational process and uh, putting together the disclosure project information with top secret documents and military witnesses and generals and ministers of defense and people who have credentials and respectability as it were as pilots or people who are at Strategic Air Command. That's very important. And that body of information is sitting there for anyone to take virtually for free. I mean, we have 60 some of these people's testimony up on the site on YouTube now for free. You know, so that is important that all of us just share that with folks. Um, when you get to governments in these G8, you know, it's very interesting, before I went over there, I regret that this wasn't actually in the film Sirius. It got, the director took it out and I don't know why. Um, but I have this beautiful letter, it's in French, um, from this admiral and the team who wrote about their commitment to make a long-term commitment for this journey with these visitors from other star systems. And 
Amazing. And it's actually from the Ministry of Defense of France on their letterhead, signed. It is the most important government document in the history of the UFO subject, and <coughs> there it sits in my vault. Um, but, uh, so, you know, what I say to folks is that over the last, that was just a few years ago, that that process continues, but it's usually very quiet. Why does SETI continue to be funded? Where you're, <coughs> you're really demonstrating like you can do all this with the, with the protocol? Like, right. I mean, it's out there for people to just go and get the app and... And do it. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter what kind of evidence you put together or even signals we get or images. Um, the subject, again, gets debunked. Um, but the other thing about the, the, the SETI project, it, like Seth Shostak and his people, they are carrying water for someone. Because you're either a blithering, you're either stupid or you're corrupt. There's two things to choose from here. If you really d dug into this and you're at that level uh, at NASA or the SETI project, um, and I debated Seth Shostak on Voice of America about this. I had my military witnesses, John Callahan, who had all the radar tapes, and we basically cleaned his clock. But it's at a certain point, I said, you cannot look at all this dispositive evidence and proof and information and just dismiss it um, while you sit there and spend hundreds of millions of dollars saying you're listening from a signal from outer space, which, by the way, they've already received and been covered up. Um, now, I'm going to say something here because this is enough years after it happened. Um, a few years ago, there was a show called um, Coast to Coast with Art Bell. And it was on the cover of Time magazine, and I was one of his favorite guests. And um, when I'd be on that show, the, it really lit things up at certain agencies. And one time I was on his show, and a few years back, uh, towards the end of his career there. And this issue came up and I said, well, you know, I have a source high up in SETI that confirms to me that they in fact have received inter interplanetary signals. But in a kind of phased, not normal array, it was kind of a pulsed um, array and that it was kept secret and covered up. And um, the SETI people were furious. Subsequently, Seth Shostak got on the show and just said, well, Dr. Greer knows what he's talking about, and he probably talked to some volunteer computer operator, because we have all this network of volunteers. What Art Bell didn't know, and which Seth Shostak didn't know, and which I'm going to say now, because it's enough water gone under the bridge, is that um, the guy who told me that was the founder of the SETI project. Uh, and, and the Drake equation, Dr. Drake. He told me that, that they had had that contact. Moreover, a man who had been one of Carl Sagan's best friends, the best man at his wedding, um, confirmed it. And he had been present when the wow signal came in at Harvard. Um, so, you know, it's very frustrating for me because, you know, these, pe th these are people who, one of them was an astronomer who was actually at the Georgetown Weston Hotel in 1997 when we were doing briefings for Congress. But his presence there resulted in him being in contact because he used to be the editor of Sky and Telescope magazine and Astronomy magazine and had worked with uh, Carl Sagan, all these people. And he said, he contacted my wife and me after that and he says, you know, I've been told that if I don't back off of this, I will never have a working position again. And I got kids in college. So he, wonderful man, wished us all the best and left. So that's how it works. And, you know, I mean, I gave up my medical career. I mean, people say, oh my God, you know, I say I gave up 500 and some thousand dollars a year to be doing this for nada. But most people who are in a situation like that, who's an academic, and what have you, unless they're independently wealthy, they really can't turn to the people who are hiring them as an editor or a professor and say, bug off. Um, and so this, this brilliant scientist who had all this information, who started to come out, he never went public, but he, at the meeting with the members of Congress, 
and these other initial witnesses we had in 97, when I was still trying to get the White House and Congress to do disclosure so I wouldn't have to do it in 2001, right before 9-11, those, the, he was at that meeting. But even being kind of out on this subject that much caused him to be contacted and be told, don't, stop it, or your career is over. He says, and he was, it was made very clear to him, you will never work again. No one will hire you. So, you know, there are a lot of people like that. And, and so there is this, um, it's not so much some sort of Illuminati, it's this, this oppressive um, condemnation of the subject along with abuse of power, you know. I mean, it's quite illegal for the CIA to be infiltrating an alleged independent Air Force investigation at the University of Colorado and put someone on their payroll to prejudice the jury and kill the report on this subject in 1969, whenever that happened, when the CIA is barred from having any domestic uh, activities. I mean, this is illegal. Go read the law. And it's also, however, why I've told people, this is why everything we're doing is legal. Very different from, say, Edward Snowden, who was disclosing information that the president knew about and certain members of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence knew about and the House Intelligence Committee knew about. The stuff I'm s disclosing are things that the president is being lied to, the head of intelligence joint staff who I briefed, Admiral Wilson was lied to, the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency was lied to, a sitting CIA director was lied to, chairman of key committees that I met with, senators and House, were lied to. I can prove that in a court of law. A priori, those projects are illegal, and I have declared them rogue and illegal, and therefore they cannot touch us. Um, and that's the difference. Oh, I want to make this a very clear point. There's a big difference between disclosing something that's being kept secret, even if it's wrong. I'm not saying that what Snowden disclosed was right or wrong. He probably did a service in the, in the, in the long run. But, but that was being overseen by the appropriate governmental elected and appointed officials. And something like this that has no constitutional oversight and is a complete criminal operation and rogue. That, and this is why you know, Danny Sheehan, who worked with me right before Disclosure Project, he and I discussed this. He's a constitutional attorney who did the Silkwood case and the Pentagon Papers representing the New York Times. And, the, and he said, look, you know, given the people you've met with and the fact that they've been denied access who are at the top of the heap, not only in the United States, but people like that I've met with in Great Britain, France, other places where they're completely being left out, that is prima facie evidence of an illegal operation. And therefore, if it's an illegal operation, it, they can't cite the rule of law to protect themselves, which is why our position was in the late 90s, early 2000s, anyone with documents, information, whatever about this, you can come forward with, without any penalty of violating your national security oath. Now, saying it and having people do it because they're afraid. You know, people have been threatened with death, people have been, but we did get enough people to come forward um, because we had a critical mass. You know, I didn't come forward with one or two, I came forward with dozens, all at once. So that was, that was the, the, the power of unity and the power of doing it. We really need to have another wave of that happen from people who are currently in government, and not just retired people. But the closer someone is to central operations at Lockheed Skunk Works, or the agency, or the NSA who know about this, and the closer in time they're related to it, the more afraid they are of tweep, like terminate with extreme prejudice, which is the euphemism for what this guy at the CIA has told me, they call it wet works, wet meaning blood, or wet works, tweep. So yeah, nice, well, welcome to my world, I live and breathe. Um, and, and that's why a lot of these people are very afraid if they're really currently in current operations. It's not that they don't understand the legal principle I just articulated. Uh, in other countries, it's, it's a minor version of the same thing. So say in France, you have friendly people, just like there are here, very interested in actually trying to do something. But then there'll be others who are in a compartmented operation tied into this international group that maintains secrecy. And at a certain point, they will be threatened. 
and that's what happened. We started, we, we actually had, I was contacted by these people in France and said, you know, an official in the United States contacted the um, ambassador uh, from France to the United States and said, what the hell do you think you're doing? After I got this document from the Ministry of Defense and this big outline of all the studies they wanted to do at post contact, biological, technological, the whole bit, it's this amazing document I have. And <laughs> I said, like, it's like, curl your hair. What little hair I have left would be curled. But when I read it, I went, wow, I can't believe I got this from the sitting government. But they got contacted, and, and basically they came to some kind of a truce where they said, well, you can do this with Dr. Greer so long as you stay on French soil. Do not try to do it anywhere else. They said, fine, fine, fine. So that's why we did it there. Stephen Bassett right now is doing a big push. Um, he turned over a bunch of documentation to Congress, and he's asking the people to contact their congressman to have a public push for disclosure. Um, how, in your opinion, what's going to be the best method to bring about disclosure, and how close are we to it? Well, as I mentioned, we've already done disclosure. The majority of people know this stuff is real. Um, I'm talking about the masses. If you do any poll, more people believe this stuff is real than have voted for any president in our lifetime. The question is whether there will be official disclosure. So let's, let's make two distinctions. Disclosure by what we're doing as a grassroots entity versus some authority figure up on Capitol Hill or at the 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or at the UN doing it. The latter is unlikely. I already, I already said that a long time ago. Uh, we had tens of thousands of people uh, faxing and writing to their members of Congress after the initial disclosure project, because I was the father of the whole global disclosure movement. Um, and then, of course, 9-11 happened, <laughs> which moved it off everyone's radar screen. My own sense is that the best way we're going to have more disclosure is to have thousands of people doing and making open contact, where it becomes something you cannot stop. The intelligence community cannot put that genie back in the bottle. And secondly, more people coming forward who are whistleblowers or insiders with documents and evidence. The likelihood that any committee of the Congress or anyone at the White House will do this uh, is, I think, very, very low. I don't care how many people write them. Uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't encourage them. It's their responsibility. But I'm just saying I've already done that over the last 20 years very, very thoroughly. Um, and a lot of people involved with disclosure now actually have never had sit-down meetings with current members of administrations in Congress. I have. And what you hear from them is that, yes, this is wonderful, but let someone else do it. I'll never forget meeting with a senator, uh, Senator Dick Bryan, who was from Nevada, whose home state has Nellis Air Force Base in Area 51, as the public calls it. Um, uh, Pahoot Mesa, S4, S9, S12, all the top secret underground facilities. And he and I met at McCarran Airport in a, what looked like a janitor's closet, and it was just a broom, and you know, taken there in a cart, and the door opens, and it's this gorgeous conference room for VIPs. This is how things are done, by the way. And uh, things really happen this way. Uh, although it would make a great movie. Uh, and uh, so we go in there, and I start talking to this guy. And he says, yes, he says, you know, I'm, you know, he's Senate Intelligence Committee. He says, but this has never been brought to my attention. And... I said, well, yes, that's why I'm meeting with you. I think I need someone like you to head up, bringing it to the attention and holding a hearing. And he just, and his chief of staff was there, literally dropped, he was reading the Wall Street Journal, dropped the paper in his lap. And the senator said, I, I don't think I really can do that. But have you talked to, so in other words, he, <laughs> you know, Kissinger called this the hottest potato in the cosmos. So this issue. And so basically, I want to pass it to someone else. So he gave me the name of someone else. So the passing of the buck on this is legendary. And I've met face to face with people who are on these committees and at the Pentagon and you know, asking them to do something about it. Um, 
which would entail enormous risk on their part. I mean, you know, as one congressman said, yeah, I'd be known as Congressman Moonbeam. Or, you know, in other words, the, 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 the press would have a field day. And, and I think that that's one of the real problems. And therefore, uh, should we exhort these leaders to do the right thing? Yes, of course, and we continue to. Do I think that that's a likely way it'll happen? No. The most likely way is more and more uh, people from the inside with evidence and corroboration coming forward and thousands of CE5 contact teams reaching a critical mass where then an undeniable event happens that can no longer be contained, that goes viral. Um, uh, now, I don't think that it's, don't take, I don't want anyone to take away from this that I, that I don't support trying to hold our leaders' feet to the fire. And that's why I put this briefing together for the president. That's why I went to Australia and met with 120 leaders from around the world and Minister of Defense of Australia and everything else. I still think that there's a responsibility if you believe in representative government to ask your representatives to do the right thing. Um, but I'm just saying from a realistic point of view, the likelihood of, of uh, change happening from those quarters. And it's a little bit like after I you know, did all this with the Clinton administration and you know, the Rockefeller family was running interference with us and hosted Bill and Hillary Clinton at the JY Ranch where I'd gone out there and had all the meeting with all these spooks and top secret people. And, um, and then, you know, there was a man who worked very closely with the Clintons who then came to our house. This is when I was still working full time as an emergency doctor in North Carolina. And he came down and had dinner with us at the table. And the, <laughs> he said, well, you know, this was like a month or two after uh, my wife and I had come up here to meet with the CIA director and his wife. And I, he said, you know, the president and the people around him are very supportive of what you're recommending. I said, oh, good. And, you know, we're having dinner around the table in this house, a big Tudor house, and the four kids or little kids back then around the table. And he says, but um, they really don't think the president can do anything about this because they're concerned he'll end up like Jack Kennedy. And I started laughing because I thought he was, he is sort of a big, fat, you know, operative for the Democratic Party who was sort of a, jokester and very funny guy. I thought he was just making sort of, you know, a facetious, and he stopped me. He said, no, we're not kidding. And I said, well, Kevin, don't talk about this in front of the kids. Let's talk about this later. So we went to the library later and talked about it. He says, no, absolutely. They think that this could actually happen, that it would be too dangerous for the president. And I said, well, what do you want me to do about it? I'm just a country doctor here in North Carolina rattling around in an ER. And they said, well, well they, they, they think you should do it. Yeah. And my eyes roll back in my head. Are you kidding me with this? Now, then you imagine, I'm in my 30s. And so, this is 1994. So, you know, 20 years, yeah, I was in my late 30s. And so I thought, well, <laughs> I said, then I said, well, well, here's the real reason, is that it is risky, but you view the president as an expendable but I am. He says, that's right, you're expendable. <laughs> Very cynical. Very Washington. Yeah, I'm throw you under the bus, who cares? You know? So I sort of, I, since then, I sort of accepted, well, I'm the throwaway guy. You know, my career, my life, none of that matters. Because, you know, in this city, you know, it's everyone's ambition. And, uh, you know, at the Rockefeller Ranch, I know for a fact that um, when they were going through the briefing materials, uh, that we put together, which we've made available to the public. The disclosure book has most of that in it. Um, but that basically, at that point, uh, Hillary stood up and said, this is too dangerous and we really can't deal with this. So. Um, and, and so what you find is that they, they are interested. Now, you know, years later, very, very close friends of, the, of, the, of the, the Clintons who used to live in the private quarters of the White House, I was meeting at her home, and, <laughs> and she told me this hilarious story that even though all the people around Bill Clinton, including his wife, didn't want, did not want him to deal with this issue because of the risks involved, 
Um, he kept the briefing document on the back of his toilet in the private quarters. And would, but one day he brought it out and was sitting with this friend of the Clintons that I knew very well and had it open. He was going through the document going, well, I know all this is true, but they won't tell me a thing, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> just like that. And when she told me this story, I just cracked up. I went, oh my God. I mean, you, you know, but you know, that's, hey, everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time and uh, no one walks on water. I, you know, I think it's, you know, it's understandable. And, uh, but to answer your question, <laughs> uh, we continue to do what you're talking about, but at, at authentic levels. I don't want to say anything disparaging about anyone, but at authentic levels because we have you know, the access to those sort of folks. But where I think the action is, is grassroots. I think it's the, the action with disclosures with the people, uh, more people coming forward who are whistleblowers. I think the, the, it's with CE5 teams reaching a critical mass, a morphogenic field around the planet that then brings this to the next level. And uh, with the energy, the same thing. The technology is the same thing. Um, and in a way, perhaps that's how it should be. If you look at human history, no big, really quantum leap or big leap forward in human history has ever come out of the centers of power, ever. It's always come from something in left field, something unexpected, bottom up. It's never come from the centers of power because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So the people who are in those systems, by definition, are trapped in the mechanism of their own de their devices, you see. And so in a sense, we're more liberated. I'll never forget in 1992, the former head of Army Intelligence pulled me aside at a meeting and uh, after we were in Florida and we were doing the CE5 work and there were 40 people on the beach and that's when you've seen the video, the, the guy goes, holy damn hot shit, and there were four of these ET. <laughs> okay, you've all seen that. It was very bad camera and there were no, we didn't have night scopes back then, but they were really quite close. You can't tell it from the camera. And that made its way over to the CIA and to this, this guy who had been the head of Army Intelligence who was doing covert stuff as a private contractor. And he was a general. And um, his, one of their best friends, and, and there was an NSA guy there also, a National Security Agency guy, and they were really concerned about what we were doing, very unhappy, um, because he basically said, you have no business doing this. I said, well, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, that's how I am, you know. I'm nice until I'm not nice, and I'm probably gonna run you over. But anyway, uh, and I just said, look, you know, I'm not doing this as a civilian, and I haven't signed a security oath to anyone, but my conscience and God and, my, and the humanity. So buzz off, it's none of your business. Um, but what was interesting, one of their friends who was at this conference came, pulled me aside later. And I, wanna, I, I want you to think about this and, and take it into your own soul. And said, you know, they, they act like they're angry at you, but they're actually really jealous. And I said, what do you mean jealous? And the head of Army Intelligence, this is NSA. They, they, they said, yes, but she said, this was a, a countess from your a member of royal family. And she said, you're free to do anything you want. And you can do these wonderful things. They are not free. They are in a system where they know that they are on a leash and they are controlled and they are in a black box. And they really are jealous of you. So don't give this kind of power more than you should to these entities. You guys, all of us have such freedom because we're not part of that corrupt system. That's the power we have because we're not part of a corrupt system either economically or politically or institutionally that restrains what we want to do, which is make contact, disclose the information, bring out these technologies. So we have this freedom to operate that people who are in the system at the Pentagon and the agency and the White House and Congress really find they don't have. So it's a beautiful thought that, you know, thank God we, I've, and I, I've been offered to be pulled into that system and turned it down. Um, because I, I, and I will not sign a security oath, by the way. All these meetings I've had, CIA director, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, members of the Senate, head of intelligence, joint staff, J2, they've all been without me signing anything regarding secrecy. 
or, and if someone says we want you to, I will not go. I said, no, nope, I'm head of the disclosure project. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> That's where all this started. Right. Asheville, North Carolina, oh, awesome. Sorry, greetings from Asheville. Uh, I hope your wife is well. She, she is. is, yes. I want to say to thank you to everyone who's prayed. Uh, you know, Emily had stage four cancer uh, f four or five months ago. I thought she was a goner, and she's completely clear, cured. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's all very abstract without having more detail. What she's asking is that she's had, she had an experience with a fully materialized craft and subsequently has had experiences, sounds like in consciousness, with someone who's in the next world, as it were. Yeah, who, who it has. Um, and the thing is to understand is to look at, uh, I, I call it, you know, it, in the ancient excuse me, times, they would call this the eye of oneness. So looking at this in a unitive way. Um, so there really is no distance between these dimensions, say the afterlife and the astral, except what our minds construct. Because your conscious mind is omnipresent. So your conscious mind can experience something from an ancestor or a relative who's in their astral body of light, whatever, in the next world, or a spirit being, an ancient spirit being, or an angelic being, I know these all exist, or an extraterrestrial spacecraft in this dimension, or that has resonated to where it's moved into astral, very close to what you would call the spirit world. Now, as I said, when the, the, the Lockheed Skunk Works guy had this, his out-of-body experience with the astral, and he hit the craft, because, but it, and it moved it, it was not as materialized what was over your head, but it was there and it looked exactly like a craft like this, but it has shifted just into that near, what I call the near astral, sort of a trans-dimensional energy field. And if you understand that all of this is on a continuum, we create these like barriers between dimensions. So in a sense, we create our own compartmentalization. So we have our bodies, we through in a 3D world, everything's linear, and that's the myth we create because that's where our understanding is.
But that's not what's actually operating all the time. And so there will be moments where we can break into and experience something in consciousness that's in this another dimension, whether it be the afterlife or an interstellar civilization that's resonating beyond the frequency of light and matter before it steps down, as it were, into 3D. But all of it is on a continuum. And the only thing that separates our understanding it or making it look like it's a us versus them, or not an us versus them, a, a yin and yang thing, is the lens we look at it through. So what we have to do is adjust our paradigm to understand that the whole con it that it not only can, but does. And it does at all times. And uh, from a higher level of consciousness, um, and perhaps from a higher level of civilization where you become interstellar, um, this understanding would be very, very normal and natural, okay? From our level, at this stage of our evolution as a society and also as individuals, it seems very strange. But I think it will become less strange as it becomes more every day. If you'll humor me, one more question that I have. So I was debating which to ask you. So, um, yes. And maybe, this, maybe everyone else knows this, but why is it that ETs accept the protocol here? And why don't they just, like the, the ones that were over my head, um, they were there for about 40 seconds. That's it. And then went straight up, straight across so you couldn't see it anymore with the trees. Right. Why didn't they stop and land and say, hey, well, the question is, why didn't they stop? You know, why wouldn't a craft stop and land and say, "Hey, they have sometimes." I just told you, at Joshua Tree, we had a this this sphere come in, and there was a being there, and literally waved it. It's on our website. And the question is, why don't they do this at you know Yankee Stadium during the the the, the, the okay? Uh, uh, this is like when Larry King asked me, "Why don't they land on the White House lawn?" I've probably been asked that question uh, thirty thousand times. Um, and and the reason, but here's the reason for it. Is a, and the answer is really an important answer. Um, how successful has our misadventure been for instituting Jeffersonian democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan? Okay, and we're dealing with humans living in the same century, on the same planet, kind of. Now, don't get me started. Okay, now, the point I'm making, without becoming politically incorrect, is that if you have a civilization that is thousands to millions of years more developed than ours, and they were to come in and force disclosure, let's say, by being that open, a couple things would happen. First, the world would divide into idolatry, people who'd worship them, like the people on the island making a, 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 the plane, the, bi, the, the propeller plane, or would demonize them. The military and intelligence community would say, we've been invaded, and we're back to the movie Independence Day. Okay, and it would galvanize the fear to justify unifying the world, as Ronald Reagan said at the UN, around an extraterrestrial threat. So if I have figured this out with my limited capabilities, I'm quite sure these interstellar civilizations have figured it out. Anything that is that frontal could be, would, would have blowback that would not be good. So they've let themselves be known in a number of ways. They've tested how humans react to that. But again, over the course of the thousands of years of human history, and particularly look at the last 50 years, it's been quite a bit, but they're still testing our responses. And, and, so, and so, so I'm trying to answer your question, so if I can finish. So the ETs do not want to do something that would precipitate either uh, panic, misunderstanding, and worse, the galvanization of uh, the military using it like a 9-11 event to create all kinds of boogeymen in space. They know that that is exactly how an event like you're talking about would be used. I know it, they know it. And so the only way that global open contact is gonna happen, like you're discussing, is that if it is under a CE5 protocol with a lot of world leaders involved, this could happen, we're working on this. 
Uh, it's done in a way that is invitational and, co and coherent. Uh, if it happens the other way, it could be something that would have a lot of bad consequences that are unintended to most people. Um, the other problem with it is that what would be the purpose in doing that if the people aren't um, ready? And you know how I think they're measuring how ready we are? Is how much we go out there and pull ourselves out of YouTube and the television and Netflix and go out under the stars together and with intent and sincerity ask them to make contact. That says to them that we're ready. And if we don't do that, then we're dilettantes. And we're sitting at home in front of our TVs being dilettantes. So I think that you have to walk the walk, not just talk it. And I think that's what they're measuring. Um, and there's uh, many people have said, well, you know, certainly they would have cures for cancer and AIDS and, and could do all, I said, yes, of course, but the, our covert programs have all these things already also. They do, it's not a myth. So they're watching that there are certain types of humans that like to keep all this secret and other types of humans who are passive or cowardly. So how do we find the, the, our voice? How do we find our, um, our courage to do this in a way that is really a good event for humanity? And I think that's the measure. Now, there are certain conditions where that may not happen. I think if we had a massive earth change type event, or if we'd gone the mutual assured destruction, a massive thermonuclear event with thousands of missiles, there, the skies would be filled with ET craft trying to intervene. But short of that sort of just cataclysmic, stupid sort of thing happening, they're going to they're gonna want us to learn and to, because this is our planet, we're the children of Earth, and they're going to want us to learn to do this, to educate one another, to care for one another, to make contact openly, and that's the measure, that's the metric they're looking. And even with disclosure, they're watching to see how much makes it out that's true and how much of it gets folded into disinformation. You know, if you read the paper I wrote, When Disclosure Serves Secrecy, if you haven't read it, you should. It's on the website. Um, where disclosure information and evidence gets folded into the whole fear mongering that is the stock and trade of the UFO subculture. Um, so I think we have to be um, aware that this is being monitored by these civilizations who I'm sure work together. Um, there's no question about it. I mean, if we have coalitions and we work together as dysfunctional as humans are, you can be assured that interstellar civilizations work together with infinite more coherence than we do. That this is being measured and observed and there are certain metrics that I think they're looking at. How mass society, media, and political establishments react, how military reacts, how the public reacts, but also what are the people doing? And at, you know, having been in the kind of the center of this for 25 years now, 2015 will be the 25th year since I founded all this, um, what, I, what I feel over and over again is that the real action is with each individual person and then coming together and making this wave happen. Uh, and I think that uh, for that reason, a forced disclosure by the ETs or an event happening from on high on Capitol Hill or the president, those are the two least likely ways. And this other path, it just involves more effort and work, um, but that's part of the lesson. You know, Earth is a schoolhouse floating through space, and we're here to learn certain lessons about self-realization, but also self-actualization and creating a new world. And I think that's really why we're here together at this time. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much for being here and stay in touch. How do you keep something secret? You hide it in plain sight. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, also some were alive. I said, well, are you going to tell the public about it?
And he says, no, we don't tell the public about this. It would uh, panic the public. And you know, there's a new name. It's unexplained aerial phenomenon. I'm a doctor in an ER taking care of shootings and stabbings and car wrecks. And I'm being asked to brief the CIA director on stuff because he and the president are being lied to? What? And he said, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And I said, I said, whose? <laughs> if the average person knew that the term UFO was actually concocted after they knew that they were extraterrestrial vehicles or man-made anti-gravity devices, they would realize that for 60 years, we've already had the solution to the environmental crisis, the energy crisis, and global poverty. The most dangerous thing going on on the planet today isn't ISIS, it's not Iraq, it's not Russia, it's not China. It's a out of control, covert group that is not being overseen by the people, the Congress, or the President, who have developed these technologies and are recklessly using them to track and target extraterrestrial vehicles. The result of this is that we're in a crisis that is unacknowledged, ironically, because these projects are unacknowledged. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. There is no threat, and we have to prevent the weaponization of space. So either they don't exist, but if they are, they're a threat. So this is the one-two punch that's been going on, unfortunately, for 60-some years. He said, do you know why they killed Marilyn? Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. And I said, well, I didn't until I got this document. It's a, a virtual death warrant. When they found out that Tesla had passed away, they came in, they had the manager of the hotel open the safe, and they took all of Tesla's papers. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, that's an urban myth or a conspiracy theory. I say, like the hell it is. This is like a bad, you know, conspiracy novel, except this became my life.